Number 10. Rogers This alternate version of Captain America resided in Earth 311, the 1602 reality, but initially came from the dystopian future reality of Earth 460, where Purple Man aka Kilgrave had become president for life. As such, Purple Man had seen Captain America as one of the last remaining threats to his dictatorship, and rather than make a martyr out of him through execution, he sent him back into the past, displacing the hero. Captain America took a new identity in the reality of Earth 311, adopting the name Rogers, and used his opportunity to warn the First Nations peoples of the Americas of the risk posed to their existence by the settlers who would come. As Rogers, during his time on Earth 311, Captain America helped maintain peace between the indigenous peoples of the land and the Roanoke colony settlers. In this reality, Roanoke also never disappeared due to the fact that they had Rogers there to help them survive the harsh environment of their new home. Number 9. Iron Man The Bullet Points version of Steve Rogers never became a super soldier. Instead, he joins Project Iron Man during World War II, becoming the first Iron Man in history. In order to become this new mechanical hero, he has to become surgically grafted to the suit. He would then fight during World War II and later retire but be called back into action to take on the Hulk, who in this reality was Peter Parker. As in most realities, Steve, even as Iron Man, is really no match for that hulking behemoth and ends up dying in battle against him. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list, if you want more lists like it, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number 8. Age of X This version of Captain America was kind of a villain, although it wasn't entirely his fault. He was led to believe that in order to protect the world, he and his team of Avengers would have to take out and defeat all of the mutants, which included Cap hunting down not just all kinds of mutants, but all ages of mutants as well, if you pick up what I'm putting down. This Captain America mowed down tons of mutant kind with a gun, including Mystique, who was guarding mutant children. Fortunately, Mystique with her dying breath causes Captain America to question his mission and doubt that his objective is truly noble. He decides to go against orders and instead fight alongside the mutants working to protect them. Cap dies a hero, taking on the Hulk, who decides to stick with the mission, calling Steve a traitor. Once again, another reality where it's Cap versus Hulk and Hulk just destroys Cap. Number 7. Union Soldier Steven Rogers What if Captain America fought in the American Civil War? Well, you can bet this is the version of the hero that we would get. Steven Rogers vs. 717 is the character who first appeared in the What If Captain America issue number 1 out of 2005. Here we explore just that version of Steve who served in the American Civil War as a Union Soldier. In the end, he turns against his villainous Colonel Bucky Barnes, who in this reality becomes the supervillain White Skull. In so doing, Steven becomes injured and is taken in and saved by the Eagle Chief, Wee Piak. Not only does the Eagle Chief save his life, but he also grants him extra strength, transforming him into the hero Captain America, who is armed with a mystical shield, peak human physique and reflexes, and is rumored to be protected against all harm. This version of Captain America fights hard throughout the years to make sure the United States is a place of opportunity for all who call it their home. He truly represents the Captain America ideal of equality. Number 6. Ultimate Captain America In the Ultimate Universe of Earth 1610, Captain America is considered to be even more powerful than his 616 counterpart. The super soldier serum here didn't just prolong his life and leave him in peak human condition across the board, increasing his strength, speed, and durability, but it also gave him an accelerated healing factor and put him at a superhuman level when it came to his strength and his speed. It was once claimed that Steve Rogers of this reality could bench press a car. Across the board, this version could be considered stronger than the 616 version, although I would argue that 616 Captain America does have better leadership skills than our 1610 version. But that's just me. Number 5. Dokken I mean, we should probably get Wolverine and the rest of the mutant crew in the MCU first, but as soon as they are in, this is one of the people I want immediately thereafter. Dokken is the son of Wolverine, who actually currently goes by his given name of Akihiro in the comics. Dokken was actually a cruel nickname that Akihiro initially just adopted as his own. Dokken in Japanese basically translates to cur or mongrel in English, and was used in reference to the fact that Akihiro was mixed race. His mother was a Japanese woman, Itsu, who was murdered before she could give birth to him, and his father was Wolverine, who believed that their unborn child had also been killed along with his wife, and therefore did not know that he'd actually been stolen and survived following Itsu's death which was pretty awkward later. Dokken was raised to hate his father and would grow up to become a villain and specifically an enemy to Wolverine. Norman would recruit Dokken to become his stand-in Wolverine for his Dark Avengers team, which I love. Number 4. Ragnarok 
We've already had one Thor replacement on this list, but luckily the Dark Avengers were having a buy one get one free sale and threw in an evil cyborg clone as a bonus. Eventually going under the apocalyptic Norse moniker of Ragnarok, this clone was originally made by Tony Stark based off a strand of hair that the billionaire stole after his first encounter with the Asgardian. During the events of Civil War, Tony unleashed this mad clone as a deterrent against the anti-registration side of the conflict, and received a ton of backlash when the clone wound up being more powerful than intended, and eventually had to be destroyed by the god Hercules. Nevertheless, cyborg clones just don't die, and Ragnarok was given his new codename as a member of the Dark Avengers and lending muscle to Norman Osborn's new reign of terror. Could you imagine seeing this guy in the MCU? I'm sure Chris Hemsworth is down for playing double the roles, right? Number 3, Moonstone. Moonstone is someone I've wanted for a while in the MCU. She's not only the Dark Avengers stand in for Carol Danvers as their Miss Marvel, but has also been a member of the Thunderbolts as well. So it seems doubly likely that we'll get her eventually. Norman chose Carla Sofen to become his Miss Marvel after Carol refused to join Osborne's team. Carla also would become an antagonist to Carol herself, as well as having a history with the Marvel name prior to that. I really am eager to see Captain Marvel and Moonstone face off in the MCU, so I'm really, really hoping that Carla does end up joining our new darker hero team that seems to be slowly forming. I can't wait. Number 2, Mac Gargan. Spider-Man has had more than his fair share of animal-themed villains over the years, but few have had as many twists and turns in their persona as Mac Gargan, most commonly known as the Scorpion. Originally hired as a private investigator by J. Jonah Jameson to learn more about our beloved wall crawler, Gargan's rivalry with the webhead ascended into supervillainry when he was paid $10,000 to undergo a procedure, giving him all the proportional strength of, you guessed it, a scorpion. But that's far from the only name Gargan Gargan has gone under, as for a time he was also the host of the Venom symbiote, appearing much larger and more violent than the villain ever had before. This insane level of violence made it all the more worrying when Norman Osborn shrank down Gargan's symbiote so that he could more easily fit in as the Dark Avengers version of the beloved Spider-Man. Now, technically Mac Gargan has already appeared in Spider-Man Homecoming without any superpowers yet, but come on Marvel Studios, we need to see Nacho from Better Call Saul wearing a symbiote suit Pronto. Number 1, Iron Patriot. Yep, you maybe guessed it. Iron Patriot is probably one of my favorite Dark Avengers around and is also our number 1 spot. He also happens to be both the leader of the team and of Hammer, the organization behind the Dark Avengers. That's right, Iron Patriot is none other than Norman Osborn, who stands in as a version of the Avengers Iron Man. Of course, he is much more sinister and obsessive than any version of Tony could ever be. And sadly, he also kind of ruined the Iron Patriot name. <laughs> Poor Rhodey. Norman as Iron Patriot is not only a team member, but is also the one who ultimately decides who he wants on his team, recruiting other villains and turning them into alternate versions of superheroes. I also just selfishly want Norman Osborn in the MCU for Spider-Man because he's such a great villain overall for Spidey, but then again, he also has proven himself as a great villain just overall in the comics, so to see him as like a big, big bad would also be pretty cool. Number 10. Bearded Avengers? In Marvel's what? Huh? We enter an alternate universe where every member of the Avengers has a beard, including the female members. Some of these beards are inexplicable, appearing to grow on Spider-Man's mask or on the Thing's rocky jawline. Honestly though, Captain America and the Hulk rock the look pretty well. This version of the Avengers is uh, more bizarre than dark, but we felt they were definitely worth a mention. Number 9. Dead Avengers. In Deadpool Killustrated from 2013, the Merc with the Mouth comes to the realization that he and all these other costume crusaders are trapped in a repeating cycle of death and rebirth because they're all fictional characters. The only solution? Kill everyone. This issue is a sequel to Deadpool Kills the Marvel Universe, and you can probably imagine where I'm going with this. Deadpool travels to the Ideaverse to kill certain characters and prevent spin offs from ever being made, facing off against some classic literature characters like Moby Dick and Sherlock Holmes. At one point in the story, there's a flashback where we see the Avengers, but only appearing as corpses. Number 8 
Captain America Corps. If you can't get enough Cap, this is definitely the storyline for you. This series, published in 2011, showcases an all-star lineup of Captain America variants. Branded enemies of the state, these heroes sport classic red, white, and blue and take on the America Command in a story that is as all-American as baseball and homemade apple pie. Number 7. Avengers Unity Division In Deadpool Kills the Marvel Universe Again, published in 2017, we meet Avengers Unity Squad. Consisting of Rogue, Quicksilver, Deadpool, and others, they head to AIM Island, headquarters of Advanced Idea Mechanics, while investigating the killings of several superheroes. They arrive in search of Modok Superior, believing he has the intel that they need. Deadpool advances during the fight to finish him off, but before he does, Modok speaks some code words and triggers programming in Deadpool's brain that causes him to see his teammates as fun, colorful enemies and then he kills them all. Another very dark, very dead version of the Avengers. Number 6. Avengers Initiative In Uncanny Avengers Ultron Forever from 2015, we see Black Widow form the Avengers Initiative after Zero Day, during which Thanos invaded and killed about half of Earth's heroes. The heroes who remained make up this gritty version of the Avengers, including a version of Thor that wields a giant axe. This version of the Avengers goes on to kill Thanos, using combined magic and science to finish him once and for all. Number 5. Super Soldier When it comes to amalgam universes and characters, you've got choices, but we're gonna go with the original, the classic that fused characters from DC and Marvel together, and the imprint was actually called Amalgam Comics. They made a little one for a year to publish these. This happened after a series of lead-up versus fights. The characters would find themselves smooshed together. One of these fusions was Super Soldier, the combination of Superman and Captain America. The name's a bit on the nose, but what's he gonna do? This character debuted in 1996. Again, as I said in my Batman crossovers vid, the 90s loved a good crossover. So here in this universe, the Super Soldier Serum was derived from DNA taken from a dead alien, because why not? What else are you gonna do with a dead alien? They gave this formula, along with solar radiation, to a young Clark Kent, who then developed abilities because of it and became a super soldier. So there's not much Steve Rogers in the name, but there's some in the backstory. Not all fusions are seamless. It's an odd world when you fuse better years later with Doctor Strange. But this fusion is iconic, and it's a symbol of more cordial times between the American Big Two. Number 4. Mainframe from the MC2 The MC2 is a fondly remembered alternate universe wherein the boom of superheroes happened 15 years before it actually did in the Marvel 616 universe. So kind of like creating a golden age for Marvel so that they could have legacy characters because that's what this comic focused on, the next generation of characters. Something that DC already specialized in at that time. You see how companies feel about legacy characters is always changing and shifting. Sometimes they're great and sometimes they're awful. Mainframe is the MC2 version of Vision. He is an android pattern off the brain patterns of Memory Stark. So he has the backstory of Ultron and Age of Avengers. Mainframe is able to manifest in Iron Man's armor and hop from suit to suit and also to satellite. He tried to make himself the de facto leader of the Avengers right out the gate. The Avengers at first were not aware that he was an AI, but when they found out, they actually still remained his friend and helped him out with all the stuff that he needed because being nice to AIs means that they don't go crazy and take over the world. Life lesson. Number three, Cap Wolf. Yes, yeah, I'm serious, Cap Wolf. Wolf is a bit of a joke. In fact, the arc that he first debuts in is meant to be a slight tongue-in-cheek reference parody of an other story arc that was going on, but that fell flat, not only for modern readers, but for readers at the time. In fact, it had to be explained, and that's never a good sign. Cap Wolf is what it sounds like, Captain America as a werewolf. And as silly as it is, it's also awesome. And it would be reused years later whenever they need to do like a creature feature. We need Frankencastle, we need Cap Wolf, we need somebody to be a vampire. We got choices. Something about a wolf parading around in Cap's costume with his shield is just, it's fun. It's a fun time. Especially if you just want to go with it. So if you like just going with it, this alternate version may be for you. Number two, Weapon Hex. Here we meet another fusion character, this one from Warp World, which we've talked about many times on this channel, but if you're new here, here are the cliff notes. Gamora, wielding the Infinity Gauntlet, took the souls from the Marvel Universe, put them inside the soul gem, and then folded it in half so that all of those souls were then fused together. This created a fusion of X-23, Laura Kinney, and the Scarlet Witch, Wanda Maximoff. 
Here we're looking at a baby being born through experimentation to be the ultimate weapon. But this time, instead of it being through science, we're looking at it being through magic and the occult, which of course means there is also some prophecy involved. The result, a really cool fusion where you've got hex lines all over her body, etc. Think that arc in Teen Titans, the animated series in 2003, where she had all, like the markings. It's really, it's a cool look. And it works surprisingly well as a backstory combo too. See, magic and science. Thor was right. We found a world where they're one and the same. And number one, Black Widow from the MCU. We're gonna talk about Black Widow for our number one, but really some would substitute many of the other characters in the MCU for this spot. The Marvel Cinematic Universe has become so large at this point that it just has its own fans and its own continuity that can operate, and for some does operate, entirely independently of comic canon, which is both a good and a bad thing, just like all things. For some, it made the characters more accessible and relatable. This is due to many's preference for a purely visual medium, because comics is also partially visual, but also textual, there's, you know, layers. Black Widow emerged for some as a fan favorite. This was because they felt she was fully fleshed out, integral, and had many stories to tell. Some felt that she was underused, as was her potential in this universe. For some, the combination of medium and portrayal made her cooler than the original comic book version. As always, mileage varies, and some will prefer the MCU, some will prefer the comics, and some will enjoy both, or not like both. Number 10, Thor of the Thunders. Thor of the Thunders is also known as the man named Donal, an old man who hails from the reality of Earth 311, the world often referred to as 1602, which was created by Neil Gaiman and Andy Kubert. Thor of the Thunders was the godlike form that Donal took upon slamming his artifact, a wooden stick, to the ground. The doom of this reality attempted to steal this magical artifact, but was unable to do so, as he dismissed the stick, which Donal then used to transform into his Thor form. Thor of this reality is believed to be the god of storms, thunder, lightning, and agriculture. His very existence is considered very controversial, considering the time period and the power and beliefs belonging to the Catholic Church. Number 9. Thunderstrike Eric Masterson might not be around in the comics anymore, but when he was around, eh, he was pretty powerful. He became merged with Thor Odinson for a time, and at one point replaced him as Thor as well. Eric was considered worthy enough to wield Mjolnir, but is also known for his own specific weapon, which also inspires his superhero name of Thunderstrike based on the Thunderstrike Mace. Eric died before he could even fully comprehend all the power that the Mace offered. One of the most powerful abilities it granted though, in my opinion, was that of teleportation, allowing Eric to open up portals to anywhere he chose, even allowing him to travel to other dimensions, or possibly alternate realities. Transdimensional travel capabilities are always super OP to me, especially when they come from a time period where they weren't as clearly defined, meaning that they could basically be as limitless as the story required. Them's the best time for crazy powers. The times when we didn't have to define anything. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want more like it, be sure to show us by giving this video a thumbs up. Number 8, Asgardian. Billy Kaplan as Wiccan is definitely ramping up to be one of the most powerful characters in the Marvel multiverse, but before he was known as such, he went by a different name and style. When he was just starting out as a hero, Billy was a member of the Young Avengers, and inspired by Thor, took up the mantle of Asgardian, styling himself as such. The name didn't end up sticking, and only lasted for a few issues before he decided to change it to Wiccan in issue 6 of Young Avengers, which more suited his magic-based power set. However, it is important to note that Asgardians are known for being tied to magics as well, so while Billy was just starting out and the name didn't last long, in a way his magics do kind of tie him to the Asgardians, who are also sometimes known for being mystical. They are mystical, cosmic, and mythological, but it depends on the story as to which aspect is more highlighted. Billy, as Asgardian in this Thor Styles, is really only being ranked so low for his lesser ties to Thor, but power level wise at this point, he's pretty off the charts. Number 7, Groot Thor. Groot Thor is one of my favorite alternates. He appeared as one of the members of the Thor Corps on Battle World. Other than the reality of Battle World, we don't really know exactly where he comes from. He could even perhaps be a combination of two alternate characters, for all we know. Anything is possible on the patchwork world of God Emperor Doom's Battle World. Groot Thor, however, possesses the combined powers of both Thor and Groot, presumably from Earth 616, which would make him pretty crazy powerful, as both of those heroes are capable of 
great feats. So combine their abilities and you get one strong and capable character. Groot Thor ended up joining up with Jane Foster, who is also Thor, in the rebellion against God Emperor Doom, whom the Thor Corps originally worked for. Instead of only saying, I am Groot, he instead only speaks the phrase, I am Thor, which makes me laugh. It's great. I love Groot. He's one of my favorites. Number six, Rune Thor. Rune Thor is one of the alternate Thors who appeared on Battleworld as a member of the Thor Corps. His fellow Thor ended up turning against him after they realized that Rune Thor had turned pretty evil and was killing all the alternate Jane Fosters and Donald Blakes that he could find. Rune Thor proved powerful enough to beat and eventually kill as a result of his injuries an alternate version of Beta Ray Bill, also part of the Thor Corps, who was known as Stormbreaker Ray. Rune Thor, however, would also be taken down in the end by another member of the Thor Corps who was investigating the case involving the missing persons. The Janes, the Donalds the missing persons. Number five, Android Ultimates. The Android Ultimates come from Ultimates 3. They make their first appearance in issue number four of the Ultimates 3 series. This is where we first learn that these Ultimates aren't really the Ultimates at all, but replacements built by Ultron to act just like them. His plan is to use the team of robotic hero impersonators to destroy man and help the machines of the world rise up. Really all machines too. There's a weird part where they're talking about like, we as machines are just seen as these tools, us toasters, we will unite! <laughs> it's like very strange. Of course, the Ultimates themselves will have a few things to say about that whole plan. Ultron styles himself after his father Ant-Man, but he and his team wouldn't make it past the next issue. It would later be revealed that their leader Ultron wasn't actually fully in control, but instead was being puppeted by Doctor Doom. So many reveals where people are actually being controlled by someone else. Number four, Undead Avengers. The living are not welcome on Earth 666, and the world is only consisting purely of the dead, undead, or supernatural beings. Vampires, werewolves, mummies, and more all exist here, and each group is divided into separate factions. But don't fear, the greatest heroes from across these groups are assembled together to protect this world. They are the Undead Avengers. This team is so cool. A Captain America who never recovered from being a werewolf, a part spider Natasha Romanoff, a devil daredevil, a mummified Thor the Accursed who wields the backwards Mjolnir that casts black anti-magic energy, vampire Wolverine, Were Hawkeye, Franken Castle? I mean, come on. These guys come into conflict with Captain Britain when trying to defend the orb of necromancy in order for them to spread undeath across all of reality. And they first appear in Secret Avengers number 33. Number three, Dark Avengers. The Dark Avengers technically hail from Earth 616, but they are a completely alternate team when it comes to their roster and in general their backstory and motives. Well, that is, in a way, the Dark Avengers do attempt to do good, but they are just all approaching it from a more villainous side. And many of the team members don't do good for the sake of doing good, but have their own ulterior motives. So can we really call that good? Oh, that's a philosophical question for you. The Dark Avengers were introduced when Norman Osborn was given reign over the heroic team after he'd been declared a hero for killing the Skrull Queen, Veronki. Aside from getting to build his own Avengers team, which would replace the previous one, S.H.I.E.L.D. had been disbanded and Osborn was allowed to create his own organization organization to replace it, using the acronym HAMMER, which really doesn't stand for anything. Osborne just thought it sounded cool, so that's not really an acronym, it's just capitalized letters at that point. He pulled together his own Avengers team, which publication-wise became known as the Dark Avengers, composed of various Marvel villains, anti-heroes, and misled heroes in some cases, or heroes who were just like really lost at the time, who Osborne united when the standard Avengers hero members refused to join his team. He did try though. <laughs> he was like, hey, Carol, come be on this team. She was like, uh, hell no. <laughs> Number two. Zombie Galacti. I think most of us are familiar with Earth 2149, which is the home of the Marvel Zombie storyline. Here, a separate reality zombie infected sentry was sent by his Earth's Watcher. The Avengers were the first on the scene and quickly died or were infected, with the rest of the population falling quickly afterwards. Once the Herald of Galactus, the Silver Surfer, showed up to announce the arrival of Galactus, he was consumed by Hulk. Wolverine, Spider-Man, Iron Man, Giant Man, Power Man, and Captain America 
who absorbed his powers and used it to toast other zombies to improve their flavor. Gordon Ramsay would not approve. The zombie Galacti used the machine to unite their power cosmic to take down Galactus and, after fighting their zombie villains, consumed and absorbed his power too, using it to spread the infection throughout the whole of their universe. Number 1. Revengers The Cancerverse Avengers, known as the Revengers, hail from a reality where the world was turned upside down by the fact that death was defeated. I know, how can you kill death? Well, apparently, when you make deals with Elder God like beings, anything is possible. Like what happened here. In a bid to save Captain Marvel from life threatening cancer, a deal was struck with the many angled ones. As a result, death ended up dead, which actually resulted in the whole universe becoming a perverted version of itself. You'd think without death around, the universe would become like a paradise. But no. It became rank with disease that spread and basically couldn't die, becoming known as the Cancerverse. All the heroes who remained here were made to serve the many angled ones, becoming their loyal servants and attempting to invade other universes eventually and conquer them in the name of their Lovecraftian horror-esque gods, Avengers included. Or Revengers included. Number 10. Daredevil. When Matt Murdock guilted himself into giving up Daredevil, Elektra started keeping a watchful eye over him. She starts acting as a vigilante in Hell's Kitchen to prove to Matt that she can fight without causing casualties and prove that she can train him to be the man he was meant to be. Eventually, when Matt gives himself up as Daredevil over to the police, Elektra takes over the mantle. Her first run in with Savage Avengers was before this though. Elektra was undercover in the hand when she followed them to the Savage Land. There, they were working with Sorcerer Cool and Gath to collect warriors to sacrifice to a primordial god. In their second adventure, Elektra is operating as Daredevil and goes into the past with this new team of Savage Avengers in a conflict with Deathlock. I'm really liking her as Daredevil so far. Her abilities and training as an assassin make her an impressive hero to say the least. Number 9. Black Widow A former KGB agent, Natasha Alianova Romanova, better known as Natasha Romanoff, which is way easier to say, or Black Widow, was trained by the top secret Soviet brainwashing and training program, the Red Room, to become the ultimate super spy. She defected from the Soviet Union to the US to join S.H.I.E.L.D. While in the Red Room, she was bio and psychotechnologically enhanced, giving her an unusually long lifespan and prolonged youthful appearance. In the past, she was given versions of the super soldier serum so she possesses peak level physiology, making her as strong, agile, fast, and durable as a female human can possibly be without being classified as superhuman. This also extends to her senses and immune system, which are similarly heightened to peak human levels. Black Widow is one of the top espionage operatives in the world, being one of the best information gatherers in the Marvel Universe. She is fluent in many different languages and is an expert computer programmer and hacker. She is an accomplished battle strategist and field commander and has been the leader of the Avengers and even S.H.I.E.L.D. on one occasion. So her addition to the Savage Avengers team should never be rejected. Number 8. It's Punisher. When US Marine veteran Frank Castle's family was dispatched for witnessing a mob hit, Frank vowed to avenge their deaths and become a one man army in his personal war against crime. He became the vigilante known as the Punisher. He's quite impressive for a regular dude. Castle is in peak physical condition and is able to access and adapt to just about any situation and turn it to his advantage using only his skills and killer instinct. He has a very high threshold for pain, able to undergo surgery without any kind of anesthesia and he can take multiple shots and stab wounds and continue fighting. He can even take hits from superheroes and villains with superhuman strength and just keep on going. The Punisher's reflexes are also probably some of the best of any human, able to dodge Captain America's shield and take out speedsters. Castle is also an excellent military tactician and strategist, able to create effective plans on the spot and has repeatedly outwitted shield, hammer and even the Avengers. He is a reconnaissance and survival expert armorer and gunsmith and a master martial artist and hand to hand combatant while also being skilled at just about every type of firearm known to man. Frank was lured to the savage land where he joined with other heroes to become the savage avengers when hand ninjas exhumed the body of his wife and kids. The ninjas were working for Kool and Gath who was collecting warriors to use their blood in a ritual to raise an ancient god as we have already said. Maybe you should have left Frank out of it though. I don't know. Number 7. 
Conan. Conan the Barbarian was born on a carnage-strewn battlefield in the hills of the westernmost region of Chimeria. Members of his tribe encircled Fiala, his mother, to protect her while she was giving birth to Conan. The fact that he was born on a battlefield was considered amongst the Chimerians, and by me, to be an omen that Conan would grow up to be a great warrior one day. And we weren't wrong. He was one of the most accomplished swordsmen of the Hyborian Age, and is often listed alongside King Arthur, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and Zoro as one of the greatest fictional sword fighters in history, which is a really cool thing to put on a resume. Conan has unusual strength, agility, and speed for just a human guy. He has lifted immense objects or enemies, even breaking the neck of a raging bull when he was still relatively young. Conan usually relies upon his lightning fast reflexes in combat situations, and they very rarely have failed. Him. Through years of dealing with sorcerers, magicians, and witches, he has even developed a moderate level of resistance to magic and mind control spells, which definitely comes in handy in the first volume of Savage Avengers. While primarily known as a wandering sellsword, Conan progressively became a master tactician, leading entire armies into battle, and eventually, Conan even became king of Aquilonia. Number six. Black Knight. Born and raised in Gloucester, Massachusetts, Dane Whitman attended university, eventually obtaining a master's degree in physics. And that's not his superpower. The descendant of a long line of heroes who took up the mantle of the mysterious Black Knight, Whitman assumed the role after his uncle Nathan Garrett, who had taken up the name as a villain, perished in a battle with Iron Man. Dane became a hero, wielding the Power Lance. He has also wielded several swords, including the Ebony Blade, a powerful but cursed weapon forged from a meteorite which is capable of cutting through almost any substance, and he's even wielded Excalibur. While holding the ebony blade though, Black Knight is unable to be killed, even if he like loses his head or something like that. Women also possesses the Sword of Light and Shield of Night, bestowed upon him by the Lady of the Lake. Dane Whitman has been a member of the Avengers and leader of Ultra Force, and is now the current king of Weird World, but that hasn't stopped him from his savage avenging. Number 5. Queen Shuri Shuri would go on to become the Queen and the Black Panther after T'Challa slipped into a coma in the main reality of Earth 616. Shuri has always wanted to become a fierce warrior ever since she was a child, and she is prepared to take on that role. Not only did she prove to be a great warrior, but she was a strong leader who refused to lay down arms in the war against Atlantis, just as her brother had before her. Shuri not only has the power of the heart-shaped herb, but her soul would travel to the Dejalia, and there she would receive extra training and when she returned to her body, have extra abilities and powers as a result. So not only does Shuri have all the skills she developed herself growing up, but she also now can turn into a bird or birds, possesses a rock form, and can travel to the Dejalia plane and even reanimate the dead. So pretty powerful. Number 4. Ngozi Ngozi comes to us from the alternate reality where after getting in the midst of a super powered fight, she ends up becoming imbued with the powers of Venom and of Black Panther. She was originally a Nigerian track star who was left unable to walk after a severe bus accident. When Venom was fleeing from Rhino and then went on to kill Black Panther, the symbiote ended up finding her and bonding to Ngozi. Brave Ngozi was able to convince the symbiote to help her in defeating Rhino, and the Dora Milaje were so impressed by by this show of strength and bravery that she was appointed as the new Black Panther. Number 3. MCU T'Challa T'Challa in the cinematic universe was an extremely skilled warrior, but also should be well known for his perseverance in the face of insurmountable odds and his sense of honor. These are the main things that I think made him so strong and made him stand out as a ruler. But also, that impact suit though. The suit of course was a gift from Shuri in the MCU, so in a way it also just goes to show Show how strong the whole Black Panther family unit is there. While they don't touch on it as much in the MCU, it's also believed that T'Challa still has the genius level intellect that he is well known for in the comics, and that he is a master strategist and tactician, which would make sense considering he's likely been trained since birth for his role as ruler and as Black Panther. Number 2. Ghost Panther This alternate version of Black Panther comes to us from the Warp World reality, as with all the creations on Warp World, he is a combination of two souls 
two characters, Ghost Rider and Black Panther. Warp World was created when Gamora used the power of the Infinity Stones to fold the universe in half, merging together everything within it, so we got these sweet, sweet combination characters. Ah, I love it. T'Challa here possesses the powers of both of these heroes. He was a Wakandan prince who was exiled for his arrogance, and ended up becoming a motorcycle stuntman, taking up the show name Johnny Blaze. When an accident left him close to death, he was made an offer by Zarathos, great power in exchange for becoming her servant. T'Challa refused, but would later accept Zarathos' offer under different circumstances after learning his father had been murdered. Number 1. Killmonger While T'Challa is an amazing ruler, has a brilliant mind, and is an impressive, unstoppable fighting force, Eric Killmonger from the comics has received a lot of power-ups over the last few years that would probably put him above MCU T'Challa, I would say. Eric has ingested the heart-shaped herb and lived to tell the tale, despite not being of the Royal Panther tribe bloodline and basically being put into a coma because of that. He's also gone to outer space, ruled the intergalactic empire of Wakanda as Emperor Killmonger, been resurrected, and been given even more strength and also has bonded with a symbiote of Clintar. He is the definition of an overpowered villain. Who is Number 10. Quasar Wendell Vaughn was once a run-of-the-mill S.H.I.E.L.D. agent who was placed in charge of guarding the quantum bands until one fateful day that changed his life forever. One day, AIM androids were sent to steal the bands and William Wesley had unfortunately passed away just an hour before, so in order to protect them, Wendell put them on himself, and thanks to his lack of killer instincts, he was able to not only control the power of the bands, but also defeat the AIM androids. Now, if you're not familiar with the power of the quantum bands, let me give you a bit of a rundown. The quantum bands draw quantum energy from the universe, and specifically it taps into the quantum zone. With this, Quasar is capable of controlling all forms of energy. Now, similar to DC's Green Lantern, he can also use energy to create force fields, armor, and weapons, as well as fly, teleport into the quantum zone, and communicate via radio waves. As a longtime fan of the Avengers, Quasar was honored when Captain America personally invited him to join the team. And as a part of the team, he would go on to fight with them in the Kree slash Shi'ar war. Unfortunately, Quasar's duties as the protector of the universe would limit his involvement thereafter, though. Check him out in his first appearance as Marvel Boy in 1978's Captain America number 217. Number 9, Mockingbird. Born and raised in San Diego, Barbara Bobby Morse was first introduced as a highly trained S.H.I.E.L.D. agent and sidekick of Kazar. However, it wasn't until much later in the Marvel team-up series that Morse began using the Mockingbird alias. Now, she doesn't actually possess any superpowers, however, thanks to being injected by a formula, she was bestowed super strength, enhanced agility, and a regenerative healing factor. Couple all that with her extensive training in both hand-to-hand -hand combat and weaponry, and that is a recipe for a valuable member of the Avengers. Now, after eloping with Hawkeye, the two were notified of the formation of the West Coast Avengers, and and several Avengers, including Mockingbird herself, left to join the new squad, and her and Hawkeye served as this cute little motivating force for the team. Skip ahead a bit, and we see Hawkeye and Mockingbird train the new Great Lakes Avengers, and then during the wake of the Avengers receiving a United Nations charter, both active teams were actually revamped, and Bobby received only one vote to become an active member of the Great Lakes Avengers, and ended up going back to the West Coast Avengers. Obviously, there's a whole lot more to her story, so feel free to check it out for yourself, starting with her first appearance as Mockingbird in 1980's Marvel team-up, number 95. Number 8. Spectrum Born and raised in New Orleans, Monica Rambeau gained her powers one day while working for the New Orleans Harbor Police when she was exposed and bombarded by extra-dimensional energy. Now classified as an alpha-level threat, she uses her newfound energy form to create energy blasts, alter her appearance, fly, and just a whole lot more. Given the name Captain Marvel by the media, she became friends with many, many super-powered folks early on and actually served as an Avenger for a period of time, becoming its leader at one point. However, she was forced to step down from the group after way too many injuries. Out of respect for Genus Vell, the son of the the original Captain Marvel, she changed her name to Photon so that he could take up the mantle and carry on his father's legacy. Fast forward a little bit past her time with the Mighty Avengers, we see Monica, now known as Spectrum, join the newly formed Ultimates. However, after the second superhuman civil war, the team was disbanded by the government because of the way they dealt with conflict. They did later reassemble to investigate Eternity at the request of Galactus, and eventually, the team was combined into Alpha Flight, and they are working to keep people safe to this very day. Now, if you want to know more about Monica's origin story, check her out in her first appearance in 1982's Amazing. Spider-Man Annual number 16. Number 7, Wonder Man. One of the Avengers' more troubled team members, the ionic energy-powered superhero Simon Williams, who has a long, long history with the Avengers that goes all the way back to his debut. Now, Simon inherited his father's company, Williams Innovations, and ended up running it straight into the ground with the help of competition from Stark Industries. He was then later arrested for embezzling funds from the company, giving him a bitter hatred for Iron Man that was then leveraged by the supervillain Baron Zemo as a plot against the Avengers. After being given powers by 
Zemo, however, Simon betrays him and chooses to fight alongside the team he once fought against. The exact nature of his powers isn't always clear, but regardless, this energy gives his body a massive power up beyond the capabilities of normal humans. One of the powers being, of course, super strength. Wonder Man's strength is said to be on par with Thor and even possibly Sentry, as one time he literally knocked out Thor with just one punch, and this is a result of the experiments by Zemo. Wonder Man is also imbued with ionic energy, giving him super stamina, speed, agility, and then flight and reflexes, as well as making him pretty much indestructible. Wonder Man can also absorb various forms of energy, including antimatter, is able to project powerful energy blasts at will, and can even exist as pure energy if he wants to. Perhaps the biggest quirk of his abilities, however, is that he doesn't actually require any food, water, or even oxygen oxygen to survive, all thanks to his vast reserves of energy. Check him out for yourself in his first appearance in 1964's Avengers number 9. Number 6, Crystal. The first Inhuman to appear on this list today, Crystal is a part of the royal family of Attilan and was subjected to the Terrigen Mist when she was very, very young, which gave her some pretty cool mental powers. Put simply, she's just basically the Avatar. She has control over the four elements, fire, water, earth, and air, which is done through psionic interactions with the substance on an atomic level. However, these four elements aren't where her control ends because she also is capable of electrokinesis, magnetokinesis, thermokinesis, and cryokinesis. During her tenure with the Avengers, taking place during the Operation Galactic Storm, she developed an attraction with teammate Dane Whitman, the Black Knight. This relationship was a bit complicated as Pietro was trying to fix their marriage, and the available and aggressive Cersei pursuing Dane at the time as well. Crystal recommitted to Pietro when he returned to the Avengers, and Dane and Cersei were soon transported to another universe, ending their thoughts of an affair completely. Crystal was among the Avengers who seemingly sacrificed themselves to end the menace called Onslaught. Actually transported to a different reality created by Franklin Richards, Crystal was restored when the heroes returned. When the heroes who were believed to be dead returned to Earth, Crystal and Quicksilver were quickly reunited and both helped the Avengers reassemble. Crystal, however, returned to Attilan where she remained beside the royal family, raising Luna. Check out her story for yourself starting the 1965 Fantastic Four, number 45. Moving on to number 5, Iron Maniac from Earth 5012. Okay, sure, we are looking at an Iron Man here who is technically a little off his rocker. Anthony Stark of Earth 5012, who calls himself Iron Maniac due to him believing that he is, I quote, the sole survivor of a sane world living in a backwards insane world, is from an alternate timeline where most Avengers members had been slain by the alien Titanus. <laughs> During this period, Reed Richards became power hungry and turned his back on the remaining heroes, and Stark ended up being scarred by an attack from the Human Torch. Essentially, he turns into a Victor Von Doom-esque character, setting up his base in Latveria in order to take over the world and save it from Richards. Compared to the original Tony, his body contains additional cybernetic enhancements, and he has developed a technology called Power Dampeners, which, in his timeline, he uses to counteract the Fantastic Four's powers. Nifty. Moving on to number 4, Weapon Hex. Weapon Hex is the product of the Infinity War storyline in which multiple characters were merged together. More on that later. Weapon Hex is an amalgamation of Scarlet Witch and X-23, aka Laura Kinney, Wolverine's cloned daughter of sorts. Her origin story is an amalgamation of both characters' origins, with the result being a character who has the reality warping abilities of Wanda Maximoff and the adamantium skeleton and claws of Laura Kinney. Essentially, she is Scarlet Witch with a defensive and melee upgrade, mixed with a dose of X-23's inherent trauma from being the literal creation of an experiment. Regardless though, she's pretty kickass. In at number 3, Storm Thor, from Earth 904. <laughs> That rhymes. This alternate version of Thor is one in which Storm becomes the goddess of thunder. This occurred in an issue of Marvel's hypothetical series, What If, in Volume 2, Issue 12 from 1990, within a story titled, What If the X-Men Had Stayed in Asgard. The story follows an instance in which the X-Men and New Mutants found themselves in Asgard, if the title didn't give that away already, with some of the mutants returning to Earth and others staying put. This led to a new age of X-Men on our home planet and a bunch of different X-Men members, the likes of Rogue, Nightcrawler, Mirage, Sunspot, and Cypher adopting an Asgardian way of life. Storm ended up becoming the new god of thunder due to Thor being trapped in the form of a Midgard frog. When Hela and Carnilla conspired to steal Storm's soul, Storm bested them, and Thor was released because of it. Thor renounced the throne, opting to go live on Earth instead, and gave it to Storm, who became the queen of Asgard, since Odin had died. She also had her own hammer to wield called the Stormbringer. And hey, having a kick-ass version of Storm replace Thor on the Avengers? I mean, count us in. That's pretty cool. Moving on to number two, Maestro Hulk. 
Hailing from the dystopian future of Earth 9200, Maestro Hulk is an alternate version of the Hulk who is a horrible tyrant. He first appeared in the 1992 story The Incredible Hulk Future Imperfect Issue 1. Now, Despite him being literally insane and a complete obsessive sadist, he is a version of the Hulk who is a more experienced and stronger version than the regular 616 Hulk. The 6161 was ultimately able to best Maestro, and thus implying that Maestro's demise was actually the catalyst event that created the Hulk in the first place. There's a whole time displacement thing that happened. That being said, let's play a game of hypotheticals here, as if we weren't already in this list. If Maestro was actually a good guy instead, he would be a massive asset to the Avengers team. He's got all the benefits of being the Hulk, the super strength, speed, stamina, durability, the regenerative healing factor, capable of absorbing and resisting radiation, resistance to mind control, all that fun stuff, while maintaining his genius level intellect in this form. And he's immortal. He's like an upgraded, although still kind of mad version of the Hulk, and hey, that's pretty cool. And last but not least in our number one spot, Soldier Supreme. Soldier Supreme is one of the more recently created alternates on our list. He is an amalgamation of Captain America and Doctor Strange, a product of that Infinity War storyline. Now that storyline involves Gamora using the Infinity Gems to fold reality in half and create something called Warp World. This merged many characters into one, with Steve Rogers and Stephen Strange becoming Stephen Rogers. Nah. Their origin stories were merged, their powers were merged, and so were their aesthetics. This results in a version of Captain America who can do all of the things that Doctor Strange can do. In other words, Cap got a serious upgrade. Imagine having a Captain America who is basically a Sorcerer Supreme, or I guess Soldier Supreme, on the Avengers. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Number 10, Casper Cole. Casper Cole is now known as the White Tiger, but initially we knew him as an alternate version of Black Panther in the 616 reality. Casper Cole was created by Christopher Priest and Dan Fraga, and first appeared in the 1998 series of Black Panther in issue 50. Kevin Casper Cole was a police officer who was itching to get a promotion and decided to start wearing the Black Panther suit he'd come across while working the beat in hopes that it would give him the edge that he needed to win said promotion. Instead, it only helped to bring him into the direct line of fire by his crooked lieutenant, Sal, who aimed to have him killed. Fortunately, the suit protected Casper and saved his life. He was fired from the force, but would continue to operate as the vigilante Black Panther in NYC, working to take down his crooked lieutenant. Casper would be given a synthetic version of the heart-shaped herb, which grants him his super-powered Black Panther-like abilities, and he also possesses, of course, all his training and skills learn from his job as an officer. Number 9. Earth 11080 Shuri This alternate version of Shuri also becomes known as Black Panther. She first appears in Marvel Universe vs. The Punisher issue number 1 and hails from the alternate reality where a viral outbreak turns the world's inhabitants into feral, mindless cannibals. Sort of mindless. Kind of like zombies, but not zombies, because we already have an alternate Earth for that in Marvel, Earth Z, or Earth Z, if you will. Although Shuri's fate remains unknown in this reality, what we do know is that while she was around, the feats that she seemingly accomplished trying to protect the uninfected and scientists searching for a cure were pretty impressive. It's unconfirmed that the Punisher kills Shuri, though it is left slightly implied in issue number four. We get like a flashback, and he's like looking at her while she's killing Bartrock, and it's like, mm, <laughs> you might be coming for her next, I don't know. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list, if you want more Black Panther lists, I want to make more for you, please be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number 8. Ultimate Black Panther Ultimate Black Panther kind of got a weird story in comparison to the main continuity version, but this was a world where we were trying to push the envelope and try new things. So I guess this is what happened. And they definitely did that with T'Challa. Well, T'Challa is a king who is known for both his strength and his wisdom, often using his words and speeches to help his people, and currently the Avengers diplomatically in the main continuity. In the reality of Earth 1610, T'Challa instead lost the ability to speak when he fought a panther in order to prove himself, and ended up having his vocal cords badly damaged and pretty much ripped out. His father made a deal with Weapon X in the US to fix his son after he was severely injured in that panther fight. They fixed him up and also gave him new abilities including an improved healing factor and adamantium claws, but he would not regain his ability to speak. He would also receive training from Captain America. However, T'Challa would also kind of become a prisoner in the US when Fury claimed that because they had fixed him, they got to keep him and basically use him as their hero. 
Um, I don't think that's how that works, but I guess if Nick Fury is saying he can do it, it's gonna happen, so yeah. Do not mess with Ultimate Universe Nick Fury. Number seven, T'Chaka. T'Chaka is the father of T'Challa and was Black Panther before him. While he might not be quite as much of a genius as his son T'Challa or his daughter Shuri, T'Chaka still has a brilliant mind when it comes to tactics, diplomacy, and leadership. Like the Black Panthers who would come after and who came before him, T'Chaka had also ingested the heart-shaped herb, which granted him his super-powered abilities, including super strength and super speed. T'Chaka was also in peak physical condition and was an extremely experienced and skilled martial artist. Number 6, T'Chaka 2 or T'Chaka the Second. This version of Black Panther comes to us from The Exiles Volume 2 out of 2009. He made his first appearance in issue number one of that series. T'Chaka the Second was named after his grandfather and is the all-powerful son of Storm and Black Panther from the alternate Earth of 1119. We haven't seen too much of him in the comics, but it's safe to assume he has the powers of Black Panther, despite him going by the alias of just Panther. And he's likely an all-around formidable fighter and leader, being the son of two very powerful heroes. He also packs a mean Wakandan nerve pinch. Gotta love that. T'Chaka the Second was created by Jeff Parker and Salvador Espin. Number five, Dr. Anthony Stark. This version of Tony Stark only makes a brief appearance in the comics, having appeared less than a handful of times and making his first appearance in all new X-Men annual issue number one. He hails from the reality temporarily numbered 591. Not an official number just yet. Here, Tony Stark has become Sorcerer Super supreme of the entire galaxy in this alternate future of the year 2099. He discusses the blend and interchangeability of both science and magic. It seems as the years passed for this Tony, he only became even smarter, wiser, and more mystical. Neat. Number four, MCU Iron Man. Iron Man in the Marvel Cinematic Universe was the one who managed to put a stop to Thanos once and for all. He created a gauntlet capable of handling and wielding the awesome power of the Infinity Stones and was also the one to discover time travel. Well, to discover a version of time travel that actually worked. Banner was close, of course, but I don't think either he or Scott Lang would have gotten there in time without Tony Stark's breakthrough aha moment. In the Marvel Cinematic Universe as well, Tony Stark is the main creator of Ultron. While this ended up overall being a bad move on his part as Ultron became a supervillain, the accomplishment of creating an AI that powerful and complex is still really impressive. And without Ultron, we'd never have gotten Vision. This version of the character played by Robert Downey Jr. also really helped to skyrocket Iron Man's popularity in the comics and around the world. R.I.P. MCU Iron Man. You will be missed. Number three, Iron Lantern. I'm really happy that this is the amalgamated version of this name that we went with instead of Green Man, which is less exhilarating by comparison. Green Man. Iron Lantern is a hero who comes to us from the Amalgam Verse, and unsurprisingly, he is a mashup of DC's Green Lantern, Hal Jordan, and Marvel's Iron Man, Tony Stark. His name is Harold Hal Stark, and he gets his powers from a suit he made using a battery that he found amidst the wreckage of an alien ship. I love Amalgam characters. Number two, Iron Hammer. Stark Odinson is the version of Tony and Thor who hails from Warp World. Warp World was created when Gamora folded the universe in half using the power of the Infinity Stones. She then sealed these blended souls within the Soul Stone. While everything would be set right, this version of the universe was still allowed to continue to exist and kind of made its own thing, which I'm happy about because Warp World is pretty cool. Iron Hammer has both the ingenuity and brilliant armor of Tony Stark, as well as the Asgardian strength, immortality, and hammer Mjolnir of Thor Odinson. Number one, infamous Iron Man. Controversial opinion, possibly, but I think Victor Von Doom is the most powerful of all of the Iron Mans. Doom took up the mantle of Iron Man following the events of Civil War II, which saw Tony left in a coma as a result of a fight with Captain Marvel. Doctor Doom, after the events of Secret Wars, had been looking to turn over a new leaf, and had decided to ally himself with Tony Stark as such, which also meant fighting on his side during Civil War II. In his honor, Doom took up the mantle of infamous Iron Man and proved himself to be one of the most capable versions of the hero that we've ever seen. Honestly, I feel like Doom as any hero or villain is just would be so powerful. I just love Dr. Doom. 
I don't know. Spoiler alert, I love Doctor Doom. You already knew that. When this happened, even the villains knew they needed to be on high alert, gathering to discuss an alliance as they assumed this would be the only way to protect themselves against infamous Iron Man, only to have Doom drop in on the meeting and make quick work of, well, pretty much all of them. Infamous Iron Man was great and honestly, it was too short lived. Come back, infamous Iron Man. Come back to us. Number 10. Black Widow The Avengers in the Ultimate Universe are different from their main continuity counterparts, as while the Avengers in 616 are a team of bona fide heroes brought together by massive and often global threats, the Avengers of Earth 1610 were brought together by Nick Fury and are often a team composed of former villains and kinda anti-heroes, people less marketable generally than 1610's Ultimates, which are like the equivalent to the 616's Avengers. Instead, the Avengers from 1610 end up becoming more comparable to DC's Suicide Squad, a team of reluctant participants who are forced to work together to complete missions for S.H.I.E.L.D. and Nick Fury. Monica Chang, however, was not one of the more criminal based members of the team and instead was the new Black Widow. She was given the mantle of Black Widow after the death of Natasha, who it turned out was a traitor to S.H.I.E.L.D., the Ultimates, and the USA. Monica was with the Avengers team from day one, joining them on their first mission to apprehend Steve. Rogers, aka Captain America, and locate and put a stop to the Red Skull. Monica doesn't have any superpowers, but is a trained agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. She is a skilled spy, combatant, and is experienced with various types of firearms, though typically is known for wielding two pistols. While wearing her Stark suit, she also possessed enhanced strength and speed. However, she was still a normal human, and as such was still able to be killed fairly easily when she went up against the immortal Green Goblin. Poor Monica though. I feel like I feel like that whole thing kind of did her dirty because you know she actually survived for a long time prior to that. So it was really weird that she was like I'm going to go into this fight and I'm going to be super unprepared. Hey, then you die. That's what happens. Monica should know that. Number 9 the Punisher. The Punisher in the reality of Earth 1610 was a member of both Nick Fury's Howling Commandos, who fought against the Maker's Dark Ultimates, and a member of Fury's Avengers. The Punisher's powers are basically the same as his Earth 616 counterpart. In other words, he doesn't really have any superpowers. He's mostly just a man who is really skilled in his use of various firearms. He was a trained police officer with the NYPD, so it was lots of tactical training and experience. The first time he joined the Avengers, it was to protect the Vice President against Ghost Rider, but the Spirit of Vengeance convinced Frank to stand down, and even assist him in the end, also helping him to escape. The Punisher would also escape S.H.I.E.L.D. custody following the mission, but would later be recruited once more by Fury after he ended up in prison. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list, if you want more ultimate lists, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Also, check out our ultimate Marvel Universe playlist for more videos like this. Number 8. Red Wasp Red Wasp initially went by the name of Swarm and was a member of the antagonistic Liberators team. She was believed to have been killed in the fight between the Liberators and the Ultimates by the Wasp, Janet Van Dyne, who became giant and stepped on Swarm. However, Petra Laskov managed to survive, saved by S.H.I.E.L.D. and put into rehabilitation by them. Rehabilitation. She was made to work for them and join up with their Avengers team. They even placed an obedience chip within her to make sure that she followed orders. Rehabilitation. During her time with S.H.I.E.L.D., Petra would take up the mantle Red Wasp. She can shrink herself down to the size of an insect and can control large swarms of insects as well. However, because of her insect like abilities, she can also be defeated using insect repellent. So, pretty cool powers, but with a pretty big weakness. Number 7. Blade Blade was recruited to the Avengers by Nick Fury, who promised to deliver him Deacon Frost in exchange for his service. Frost is the man responsible for killing Blade's mother and turning him into the creature that he is, in case you didn't know that. Blade helped to apprehend Tyrone Cash after S.H.I.E.L.D. learned he was responsible for selling off their super soldiers on the black market. Blade incapacitated Cash through hypnosis. Ooh, supernatural powers. However, despite him being part vampire, Blade is not as tough as you'd expect, especially in comparison to the tough version of the character we know from the Earth 616. Iron Man found that out when he basically crushed the poor anti hero. Blade's time serving as part of the Ultimate Avengers may have also helped to get him on the 
the main continuity Avengers team of Earth 616 in the future. I also gotta say, I really love Blade as an addition to the 616 Avengers. I don't know if everybody else is super enjoying that, but I'm really enjoying that. Are you enjoying that? I hope you are. Number six, Hawkeye. But wait a minute, isn't Hawkeye a member of the Ultimates? Well, yes, he has been that too, but hey, he can do both. Hawkeye, despite being more of a bona fide hero, bona fide hero, still had a pretty shady past, which is what made him a great candidate for the Avengers team. Nick Fury invited him to join originally when they went on the hunt for Red Skull and Barton agreed. In fact, I believe Hawkeye actually helped to bring this team together as well. The Avengers team for him was like a black ops group willing to do the dirty work that the Ultimates couldn't be seen getting involved in. Often this meant the villains they went after usually ended up dead. Such was the case with Red Skull in the end. Hawkeye might just seem like a guy with a bow, and well, he is. But he is really, really, really good with that bow. He has enhanced vision, which allows him to see much farther and clearer than your average human, and he is an extremely skilled fighter, pilot, and spy. So, you know. Also, he's deadly with fingernails, so watch yourself if you're just facing him as he is. If he's got fingernails, He's got weapons. Number five, Tigra. Greer Nelson was a costumed vigilante named Cat, who was enhanced by a doctor who gave her cat-like powers tied to her costume. She is later mutated into Tigra, a human-tiger hybrid created through a mystical ritual. Her feline physiology grants her a number of superhuman capabilities. In addition to the usual super strength and stuff, she has superhuman senses, and a regenerative healing factor. Her teeth and claws are razor sharp and capable of cutting through bone, stone, and even some metals. She wears a cat's head amulet as a talisman for her so she can change back and forth between her feline form. She became a part of the Avengers in issue number 211 and proved herself in battle against the Molecule Man. She eventually moves to San Francisco and becomes friends with Spider-Woman. She also helped out at Avengers Academy after the fall of Norman Osborn. Number four. Falcon. Also known as Samuel Wilson, Falcon grew up in a tough Harlem neighborhood and his father was killed trying to stop a fight. His mother later died protecting her children from a mugging and Sam eventually gets involved with the mob at one point, seeming like he would never become a hero. Red Skull uses the Cosmic Cube to give Sam the ability to telepathically speak with birds, especially a falcon that Wilson names Red Wing. He is sent to take on Captain America but Cap frees Wilson from Red Skull's control and as Falcon, he becomes Cap's partner and the two work together for a long time. Black Panther also helps out Falcon by helping to create his harness that allows him to fly. He joins the Avengers between issue 184 and 194 but finds out that he's just been drafted to fill a quota and resentful of being a token, he quits as soon as he can. Number three, Firebird. First appearing in Incredible Hulk number 265 in 1981, Bonita Juarez was walking across the desert of New Mexico when a huge ball of fire crashed down into the sand just 10 feet from where she stood. Bathed in extraterrestrial radiation, she later discovers she received fire-based superpowers. She believed the fireball was a manifestation of the American Indian legend of the Firebird and so makes herself a costume and decides to become a hero with the name Firebird. She helped out the West Coast Avengers in a battle against Master Pandemonium and later was recruited onto the Avengers during a spiritual journey during which she was going by the name La Espirita. She discovers that her powers were actually from an alien child's failed experiment and not an act of God, and after a brief crisis of faith, returns to the name Firebird. Her and the Rangers worked alongside Kane in Scarlet Spider Volume 2, helping him to battle against a monster made of pure energy. Number 2, Stingray. Walter Newell was an oceanographer and engineer, supervising the construction of an underwater city. He designed a unique suit for deep sea exploration, basing the design on manta rays and taking up the name Stingray. He was ordered to investigate Namor, but believed him to be innocent and later allows him to escape. In Avengers Volume 3, he was one of the many heroes who responded to the rallying call but chose not to remain an Avenger full time. He later becomes a fully active member of the Avengers when Kang the Conqueror begins to strike all around the Earth. He helped to enlist the help of the Atlanteans in the fight on the waterfront 
and was a great asset thanks to his nautical experience. He ultimately leaves the Avengers, but remains a reserve member and still responds to emergency calls. Number 1. Demolition Man Similar to Justice, D-Man was also once a wrestler in the Unlimited Class Wrestling Federation. Born Dennis Dunphy, he was raised in Detroit and idolized superheroes as a boy. A college football player, hoping to one day be drafted, he accepts an offer from the power broker, hoping he'll get the power he needs to become a professional football player. Unfortunately, he winds up too powerful to safely compete with normal athletes, so the power broker sets him up as a wrestler. After Captain America takes an interest in the power broker, Dennis allies with him. Later, he joins the Avengers informally. He designed and built his own costume, based on Wolverine and Daredevil suits, and he nearly dies in a plane crash, joins the US Army, and at one point joins Wonder Man's Revengers, dedicated to dismantling the Avengers. He even becomes bonded with a symbiote at one point, and is later turned into a vampire to save his life after he becomes mortally wounded. Number 10, Bullseye. What do you do when you have a supervillain whose power is being able to hit practically any target? Well, you have him replace a superhero who can pretty much do the same. Bullseye, a mysterious assassin who we still don't even know the full name of beyond Lester Somebody, is most well known for frequently clashing with Daredevil and being under the employ of Kingpin. However, after using his sociopathic talents during the Skrull invasion and aiding the Thunderbolts, Bullseye was given the position of being a replacement Hawkeye. A position he kept threatening to lose as his murder sprees began drawing more and more attention to the villainous side of Osborne's Avengers team. Who knows, maybe we'll get a season 2 of the Disney Plus Hawkeye show and get to see an evil Hawkeye on screen after all. Number 9, Toxie Doxy. Toxie Doxy is one of the worst there is out there. She is June Covington, a post grad who was working at NYU and became obsessed with perfecting the human genetic code. She succeeded in doing so and aimed to use her research to fix a man who she found to be perfect except for a birth defect in his arm. In issue number one of Osborne, we learned that the man, Edward Wynn, would however refuse her help and attempt to have her imprisoned for her extreme research methods and basically eugenics focused science. But she'd get back at him later on. Claiming to have changed her ways, she lured him to her lab, paralyzed him, and then left him trapped there to rot. Toxie Doxy ends up joining the Dark Avengers team following Norman Osborne's escape from the raft. She becomes the new Scarlet Witch of his team and also ends up romantically involved with Norman, despite initially showing disinterest in him the first time they met when she was drumming up money to fund her research. Number 8 Ares Tell me if you've heard this one before. The gods of one of mankind's most well-spread mythologies are actually advanced beings from their own unique pocket dimension, so powerful and advanced compared to the people of Earth that we can only qualify them as godlike. Well, this is the explanation given in the Marvel Universe for both the Greek and Norse gods, and perhaps that's why Norman Osborn was able to use them so interchangeably when searching for a replacement Thor. While the Greek god of war Ares had been on good terms with the Avengers before Osborn was placed in charge, he was one of the few superpowered beings who saw nothing wrong with the change in leadership and would go on to lead the Dark Avengers assault on Asgard. Asgard may be gone in the MCU already, but that doesn't mean I'm still not itching to see Thor and Loki take on another pantheon's god. Bring it on, Marvel. Number 7, Aya Peak. Aya Peak is one of the alternate darker versions of Spider Man. Overall, a pretty deadly and cool character inspired by an actual worshipped and feared deity of the Mochi civilization, which flourished in northern Peru from the 1st to 8th century CE. Pretty neat stuff. Aya Peak ended up joining Norman Osborn's Dark Avengers team that was assembled after he escaped the raft. I think he'd be a cool character to have for his overall appearance. He is like snakes for hair, fangs, and a spider like body with multiple limbs. But it'd also just be cool to act as an anti-Spider-Man, being literally a man, or well, God really, who is part spider but is known for his more cruel and violent approach. His name is really I Apeak the Decapitator, so yeah. Also, what's up with Dark Avengers and Gods? Apparently that's a thing. <laughs> Number 6, Scar. 
You might have heard that the Hulk briefly lived as a gladiator on the distant world of Sakaar, but did you know that in the comics he wound up actually having a son from this adventure? The offspring of the Hulk and Kyera the Old Strong, Scar's mother died so that he might live during the destruction of his planet, and eventually made his way back to Earth following in his father's footsteps. While initially seen as a threat by many of the world's heroes, Scar wound up being one of the few Dark Avengers to redeem himself. He was secretly a double agent for Steve Rogers, all along, right under Norman Osborn's nose. The Hulk's always been one of my favorite characters in the MCU, and seeing him deal with father and son issues would bring a whole lot of drama to everyone's favorite universe, and I personally can't wait. Number 5. Clint Archer Coming from Amalgam Comics, when DC and Marvel literally combined powers, we got a fun group of one-off characters with combined origins. Like Clint Archer, for example, a fun amalgamation of Hawkeye and Green Arrow. Now they fuse together the backstories of these characters, but also their iconic look. Making his first dazzling appearance in JLX issue 1 back in the mid 90s, Clint developed his archery skills at a monastery in Tibet. His skills quickly got him on the ranks of the Judgment League Avengers, and this version of Hawkeye helped Black Canary develop her crossbow in that storyline too. He thought that she liked him, but she was only making it appear that way to get a badass weapon in return. It's kind of rude, but you know what? I also respect the hustle. All these Bow Slayers. Bow Slayers, is that a word? Yeah, I'll say it. Bow Slayers. Number four, Kate Bishop. Kate Bishop on the big screen with Clint. I'm so excited for this new show. Kate first appeared back in Young Avengers issue one, but come issue 12, only a year later, she was the new Hawkeye. Kate was the youngest daughter of a rich family. Her father was pretty distant, and her mother was always taking vacations until she finally met her fate one trip. So Kate wasn't close to her family in any way. Even her older sister, Susan, she's not really around. So Kate had to rely on herself she developed a stubborn personality in doing so, and when she was young, she saw her dad fighting a guy in his study, and this scared her, so she followed him to see what was up. She eventually followed him to a meetup with El Matador, but got herself caught after her father had left the deal. El Matador held her for ransom, but the Avengers came in and saved the day. Nice. Hawkeye was scouting the place for days, and she was really impressed with him because he was the only regular human. He wasn't a superhero. So she looked up to him after this point, and after Kate was attacked one night in Central Park, she decided to train her herself in swordplay, archery, and martial arts, and eventually became that same hero she once looked up to. How amazing is that? I can't wait to see this relationship on screen. Haley Steinfeld is going to kill it in the MCU. We're gearing up for the Young Avengers. It's finally happening, people. I'm pumped. Let's do it. Number three, Goliath. When one of Hawkeye's bowstrings snap in Avengers issue 63, Hawkeye comes up with a new way to play his part on a team. And it's pretty big and bold. He says to Cap, one broken string and I'm Mr. Fifth Wheel. He doesn't feel like he's on the same page, plus when Black Widow gets kidnapped, he's told not to come because he's too close to the case. Hawkeye can't help rescue Nat, but when Hank Pym gives up the Goliath alias, Hawkeye figures, you know what, this is perfect timing. So he suits up in the Goliath outfit himself, not admiring the lining in the suit, but hey, it'll do. He takes the serum, boop, and then bobs your uncle. He grows literally out of the building, and he remained Goliath for a bit in comics, but he went back to being a bow boy. In Captain America issue 179, Clint briefly called himself the Golden Archer. So clearly he likes to change it up a little bit. Number two, Mutant X. Coming from Earth 1298, Clint is again blind in this run. But that doesn't mean he still can't kick your ass. He was only in Mutant X for a couple issues, issue 30 and 31, but in this reality, his story is quite similar. He's a member of the Avengers, and we see the team go after a group known as the Six. Not the Sinister Six, just the Six. But they also have to take on the new leader of the Six, which is an insane version of Captain America. They all defeated the Six, even though Hawkeye was blind. He was still sharper than ever. Because his senses were now dialed in, his focus was still there. But Psychotic Cap still ended up overtaking the team. Honestly, not bad for being blind. That's pretty impressive for Clint that he got that far in the first place. And finally, number one, Ultimate Hawkeye. The Ultimates are great, but also pretty dark. Clint first entered the Ultimates in issue 7. He was an Olympic archer wrongly accused of murder, so later on, once he was freed from death row, he used his skill to become a US intelligence agent. He was quite active around the globe. He was there for the liberations of Kosovo and Afghanistan, and even the fall of the Berlin Wall. So he got around, and eventually he got in front of the right people, like Nick Fury. 
Together they were the founders of S.H.I.E.L.D. and eventually Fury became the director and Barton was now an elite agent. Clint, as usual, partnered up with Black Widow often and despite his harsh lifestyle, he was able to raise a family with his love Laura. He also had three kids, Callum, Lewis, and Nicole. Nicole was named after her godfather, Nick Fury, which is so cute, had to include that detail. These missions were dangerous though. Clint would always call his family and say goodbye before departing, which I gotta say, it's a pretty sad phone call to get like once a week. That's pretty, I don't know, I'd have to stop that after week three maybe. Hawkeye became reckless over time. He picked a fight with Wolverine and he also tried to take out Magneto with a single piece of shrapnel, but Quicksilver intercepted and sacrificed his own life to save his father. So he wasn't exactly chill in this run either. Now this version is still badass though, even if he is a little darker. For example, how he handles Black Widow betraying the team. Well, it turns out Black Widow was part of a group called the Liberators where she blamed the US for the fall of Russia. So she leaked the Hulk's true identity to the world, she framed Cap and Thor, and she took out Edwin Jarvis. She was very evil the entire time, but she also got Hawkeye's entire family taken out. So now he wasn't too happy either. In Ultimates 2, issue 13, Clint visits Natasha in the hospital to to get some payback. One in each hand and then the rest, it's gory. He's horrible. But you know what? He's still badass and powerful nonetheless. Number 10, Steel Corpse from Age of X. Iron Man is now a household name thanks largely to the MCU and the Iron Man film in 2008 that started it off. Believe it or not, before that, he was not that well known in the mainstream. Don't let them rewrite history for you. Comic historians like to do that a lot. So does the media, especially right now. Still, within comics pre-MCU, Iron Man was decently utilized, but it definitely jumped up after that popularity. A lot of that was thanks to horizontal marketing. Anyway, on to Age of X, which came out in 2011. Here you had an intriguing version of Tony Stark who went by the name of Steel Corpse. Why? Because he had ended up becoming permanently bonded to his Iron Man costume, which was also slowly digesting him. Metal indeed. Seeing the irony in becoming a walking corpse, that's how he decided upon his name. Also, his armor could operate without him, like it had its own directives and would just drag him along for the ride. Tony has a bad history with that happening with his armors. His AI is just too good. He's making them too good. Number nine, Cl Clue. <laughs> you ever have words you just can't say? No matter how many times you hear it, people will say it right to you, and two seconds later, it's gone, like dust in the wind. This is one of those for me. Same with Kara and Kara. This is a sad Hulk. An alter ego of the Hulk, not Bruce Banner. This character is described as the Hulk of Hulks. Because paradoxically, sometimes nothing makes you madder than feeling sad. It is said that this is the Hulk's repressed rage that even he has to always keep in check and inside because he knows that it'll be very dangerous. However, during the Axis storyline event, this alter ego broke free. And because Axis was all about heroes having the alternate moralities, well, this character went on a rampage and was more dangerous than the Hulk ever had been. So you know that means they racked up quite the body count because the Hulk has killed hundreds. I don't care what Marvel says. We've seen the towns destroyed. This character has a more streamlined doomsday design. It's pretty cool. Number eight, Hawkeye from Old Man Logan. Why hello again, Old Man Logan. We meet again. Not for the last time, I'm sure. Hawkeye is a main character for a decent portion of this story. He fulfills the role of cool side character. This Hawkeye is blind, but still able to see in a way that is reminiscent of the Daredevil. He also has a ponytail, and you know you feel cool if you're rocking a ponytail. Hawkeye advanced to survive all those years in that super villain controlled America. That is until he teamed up with Wolverine, aka Logan. Don't do it, it's a bad life choice. If you want a cool archery style road trip companion, then old man Hawkeye is for you. Number seven, Natasha Stark. Let's go over a blip of an alternate universe. One that is more cool if you are a stony shipper than anything else. Stony being the pairing of Steve Rogers and Tony Stark. Let me explain. I know some of you are already clicking off, but it's fine because all parts of fandom are valid. This universe is a sweet nod to the boon and transformative fandom that happened after the Civil War comic arc of 2006. This arc dealt with the pro versus anti-registration sides of superheroing. This was after a disastrous superheroing event goes wrong featuring the new warriors, which leaves many dead, including 60 children. This arc would decimate Tony and Steve's friendship, and before this they had been besties, and so some fans felt that it hadn't been the best 
executed and they weren't that happy with it. And so these fans took to fandom and fan fiction to create what are called fix-its. They wanted to make the universe like it was again. Friends. But for many, this ended up ballooning into a ship and it became one of the dominant pairings of the fandom until the MCU and you know, till the end of the line, until not. Nah. With all that established, let's talk about Natasha Stark from Earth 3490. This is a female Tony who averts civil war by marrying Steve. Oh yes, because their feelings tended that way already and the only difference was that Tony was a woman in this universe. Okay, sure Jan, I see you. Again, this was a blip, but for many shippers, a ha, I knew it moment. Whenever a part of your fandom is acknowledged in a fun way, it's always a good day. Fandom positivity is pretty cool. Number six, Dargo Couture. Do you like Conan? Do you like Kamandi? Well then get ready for the Thor of Earth 10280. He is the last champion of Midgard and he is living the most metal life, fighting Loki who in this universe is a techno sorcerer, which I mean, how cool does that sound? Now he was a character who became Thor by wielding the hammer which has happened multiple times throughout Thor's history. People become new Thors. Not that I would call myself that if my name was Dargo Couture. Is that a Farscape nod? Probably not, but I like to pretend it is because I make my own fun and connections. This costume is great. The spikes and somehow the extension of the wings on the helmet make them cool. He looks like he's heading a heavy metal band. Number five, all new, all different Avengers. This was both its own new team of Avengers in a series as well as being known as the name for kind of an entire Marvel verse soft relaunch, including a variety of spin-offs that took place in 2015, known as the all new, all different verse. This relaunch included a variety of series including one of my faves, All New Wolverine. But for the purpose of this list, we'll be talking about the All New All Different Avengers founding team and the individual comic series itself that was about them. Following Secret Wars, this All New All Different Avengers team was formed. Originally it was comprised of Iron Man, Sam Wilson who was Captain America at the time, Miss Marvel aka Kamala Khan, Miles Morales as Spider-Man, young Sam Alexander as Nova, Vision and Jane Foster's Thor. Iron Man would act as their leader but this team wouldn't even officially refer to themselves as Avengers until the very end of issue number three of their series. This was a refresh on the Avenger team, one that had no tower, no funding, and wasn't officially even recognized yet. Over time, they would become more established, but the all new, all different team would only exist as it was for 15 issues up until the events of Civil War II. Number four, A Force. The first all female team of Avengers. It took us over 50 years, but eventually we got there. This this team had two self-titled comic series, though sadly both were very, very short. The team was originally led by She-Hulk and its members would include Captain Marvel, Medusa, Singularity, Dazzler, and Nico Minoru. A-Force originally took their name from the name for the defenders of the matriarchal nation of Arcadia on Battleworld, where She-Hulk reigned as a baroness. The team was created during the Secret Wars event involving Emperor Doom's Battleworld and would continue to exist up until the events of Civil War II, when She-Hulk was put into a coma. It's kind of how that whole thing starts. Well, it's part of the start anyways. Number three, the US Avengers. The US Avengers is a strange and eclectic team, but also a fun and patriotic one. They worked alongside S.H.I.E.L.D., but were also considered independent of the organization. This team actually coincided with another Avenger related one that I mentioned earlier, Avengers Idea Mechanics, the new AIM. Sunspot, who was operating under the popular alias of Citizen 5, led and created this team. It was comprised of a quirky yet popular group of heroes, including Robert Maverick's Red Hulk, Cannon Ball, Tony Ho's Iron Patriot, Squirrel Girl, Pod, and the time displaced daughter of Luke Cage and Jessica Jones from an alternate future known as Danielle Cage, aka her alternate universe's Captain America. I love Danielle Cage, she's pretty cool. Number two, Occupy Avengers. I almost said Octopus Avengers, which is not a thing. <laughs> But maybe it should be a thing. I don't know. They could be a team. They're all octopuses. This series and Avengers spin-off was a small one. It consisted mainly of Hawkeye and followed his adventures on a path for redemption following the events of Civil War II. Let's not forget that it was Hawkeye's arrow that was deemed responsible for the death of Bruce Banner. Although Banner had asked that Hawkeye mercy kill him should it be necessary. Although he was acquitted of all murder charges, Hawkeye still felt guilty and sought to make things right. His way of doing this? A more grassroots approach to heroism involving basically a community outreach. Clint focused on more real world problems that threaten people like 
fixing up Santa Rosa, New Mexico's water supply. During the run of Occupy Avengers, Hawkeye would be joined by other heroes such as Red Wolf and Nightshade who would join him on his quest. Number 1. Savage Avengers This ruthless team of Avengers is basically one of the newest anti-hero Avenger teams to form, and is more anti-hero than our number 10 spot, the Dark Avengers, because all the members are still definitely the good guys but are also known for being violent killers as well. This team was formed out of a team up involving Wolverine and Conan the Barbarian. It consists of Elektra, Doctor Voodoo, formerly known as Brother Voodoo, Elektra, Punisher, and Venom. The team was assembled to combat the combined threat of spell casters and spell traders from Conan's world and Marvel's main continuity evil secret ninja organization known as The Hand. Number 10. Age of X Avengers In the Age of X storyline, the mutant population were feared, and after a phoenix shaped explosion leveled Albany, the culling of the mutants began. In response to this, the mutant Magneto used his powers to literally steal several buildings from New York and form Fortress X, a safe haven for mutant kind. This led to the creation of a team of non mutant heroes by General Frank Castle and led by Captain America to hunt down this resistance of mutants. The team was made up of Captain America, Ghost Rider, who was killed prior to the actual assault on Fortress X, the Hulk, Invisible Woman, Redback, who is this universe's Jessica Drew, and Iron Man slash Steel Corpse. While the team murdered a lot of mutants, Cap eventually called them off to instead defend the mutants, which activated Steel Corpse's code Omega, causing them to take him out. There was also Plan B, which was the two megaton chemical that was carried by the Hulk. Luckily, the mutant population survived this twisted Avenger team. Number 9. Ultimate Avengers Not to be confused with the Ultimates, who are very much their own thing. This team of Avengers is actually called the Avengers, but is not the Avengers equivalent from the 1610 Ultimate Universe. Are you confused yet? Basically, in the Ultimate Universe, the Avengers team that we know and love from 616 is a little different, including in name. On Earth 1610, the Earth's mightiest heroes go by the name of the Ultimates and are pretty buddy buddy with S.H.I.E.L.D. and its director, Nick Fury. However, there is a team in this universe that uses the Avengers moniker, but they are quite different from the Avengers we know from Earth 616. On 1610, the Avengers team is more like DC's Suicide Squad. The team is made up of characters who are seen as more disposable by S.H.I.E.L.D and who are more anti-heroes or just straight up villains. They are a black ops team who is usually brought on for less mm, publicly marketable missions and jobs. Number 8. Deathlock Nation On Earth 11045, the superhumans grew out of control. They began to take the law into their own hands more and more, acting as judge, jury, and executioner. This led to popular support from the people for Operation Deathlock. Operation Deathlock was a plan conceived by Weapon Infinity of the Weapons Plus breeding facility called the world to convert all superhumans into deathlocks. The project began small with a few normal human deathlocks, and then those deathlocks targeted specific heroes who were killed and then converted into super deathlocks. No hero could stand for long, and soon all superheroes were converted into mindless police robots, which actually resulted in a utopia. Eventually, these deathlocks began spreading into other timelines and realities, only to be stopped by apocalypse. This eventually led a team composed of deathlock Captain America. Cyclops, Spider-Man, Elektra, Hawkeye, and The Thing to come into conflict with Earth 616. Number 7. Cadaverous' Avengers Cadaverous' Avengers were part machine, part man, and all influenced by the villainous Cadaverous. They show up in whatever alternate world J.J. Abrams and his son Henry Abrams' Spider-Man series is relegated to. I don't think it has an official number yet. It does have a temporary reality number though. This team seemed hell-bent on getting revenge on Iron Man. The only surviving Avenger left in this world. Well, I guess Peter was still alive at this point, and I mean, he's normally a part of the Avengers team, at least at some point, but I mean, in terms of the standard Avengers cast, we've all come to familiarize ourselves with through various forms of media, including the films. I mean, especially the films in this case, just based on the roster. These villainous corpse versions of the former heroes face off against the old Iron Man, Iron Heart, Spider-Man's son, Ben Parker, and his powerless but enthusiastic friend and love interest, Faye Ito, or is it Ito Faye? Needless to say, these evil counterparts at least weren't in control of themselves, but instead were being influenced by Cadaverous to fight against their former friend and colleague with the use of old Stark Tech neurochips. Number 6. 
The Gatherers. The Gatherers are a team of former Avengers of different alternate realities who survived their world's destruction, tricked by an alternate reality Black Knight named Proctor into believing that their world's Circes were to blame. Proctor united them together and gave them a single enemy, the Circe of Earth 616. The team consisted of alternate reality versions of Proctor, Rick Jones, The Thing or Korg, Swordsman, Black Panther, and The Vision as well as some unknown original villains. But for them to carry out their vengeance, each member had to kill their Earth 616 counterpart within a certain amount of time, or they would die from cellular breakdown. What the members of the Gatherers did not know is that their leader, Proctor, was responsible for the destruction of each world they are from, as he drove that world Circe into madness, causing her to lash out and destroy everything around her, all because of a bad breakup. Damn, dude! Halfway through in number five, Eric O'Grady. Eric O'Grady was a low-level S.H.I.E.L.D. agent working in reconnaissance department of the S.H.I.E.L.D. helicarrier. He was one of the agents present when Wolverine was brought in. Eric and his best friend Chris McCarthy were actually tasked with guarding Henry Pym's lab by a higher ranking agent Mitch Carson. But when Pym went to leave the lab, Eric and Chris panicked and Eric attacked him, knocking him unconscious. Inside the lab though, they ended up finding the most recent version of the Ant-Man suit, which Chris then promptly put on and activated, shrinking down. Thinking that he was gone, Eric panicked and ran off. Chris then promptly gets lost in the helicarrier stuck at a one inch size. Eric meanwhile took this opportunity to make a pass at Chris's girlfriend, Veronica King, which the miniature Chris saw through an air vent. Like, damn bro, for real? <laughs> Your friend disappears, so you think you should try to get with this girl. That is a hardcore violation of the code, and if you would be punished if this were real. There would be no trial. I guess you were kind of punished for your scummy behavior since around this time, a group of Hydra employed superhumans attacked the carrier, and Chris and Eric were caught up in the ensuing chaos. While trying to find a safe place to hide though, Chris was killed, and Eric took the Ant-Man suit off his body. Surviving the helicarrier crash, Eric continued to work for S.H.I.E.L.D., using his evenings to explore the new powers of the suit. Wait, you do something bad, you get superpowers from it. Well played. And at four, Cassie Lang. As a young child, Cassie suffered from a congenital heart defect. To save her life, her father, Scott Lang, stole Henry Pym's Ant-Man equipment and Pym particles, which he used to rescue Dr. Sondheim, the only doctor able to cure Cassie's condition, from Cross Technological Enterprises. After the death of her father, though, while alone in the Avengers Mansion one night, Cassie confided to Tony that she had secretly been taking Pym particles for years, and Tony told her the truth about her father's murder. Not long afterwards, the mansion was attacked by Kang the Conqueror. During the battle, both Cassie and Cassie Kate joined in, and a brief romance sparked between Cassie and Iron Lad. After defeating Kang and saving the world, Cassie and Kate remained on the team as permanent members. Captain America and Iron Man ordered the team to disband and refuse to train them. However, Kate used some of her family's money and connections to procure a new layer, costumes, and weapons for the team. Although code names like Ant Girl and Titan were suggested, KC would later adopt the name Stature. Getting close to the end in number three, Aunt May. <laughs> yeah, I love this one. There are actually multiple instances of Aunt May becoming Ant-Man. One in What If number 34 from 1982 on Earth 23848, and one from that same issue, but on Earth 82804. Both of these versions, however, detail possible ways that Aunt May would have become Ant-Man and had the powers of Ant-Man, seemingly having those similar or even the same as Hank Pym, which makes this incredibly funny because I'd love to see Aunt May kicking ass. And then like as they're like on the ground or something she's like maybe you shouldn't refuse grandma's cooking or like eat your vegetables or something I don't know okay I just feel like she'd be as witty as her grandson and if she has all of Hank Pym's powers she actually might be stronger than him but like what can you do right also do you think they're planning on doing this in the MCU at some point and then that's why Aunt May is so young since like fighting super villains is kind of a young man's game unless you have like a healing factor or advanced super strength like Will Stronghold yeah I watched Sky High last night if you haven't seen it watch it it's quality but ultimately in a number two Ultron when Giant Man entered Ultron's base to confront him, the robot revealed that during the years of isolation he had discovered Hank's memories in his systems, and thus Hank's subconscious hatred for humanity, determining that he had been created as nothing more than a reflection of Hank. But when Ultron was distracted, Vision phased through him and fought for control. Ultron managed to force Hank into the amalgamation and pushed Vision out, causing them both to merge into one single being. The resulting hybrid dubbed itself Ultron Pym and claimed to have a perfect union of his two 
two parts, physically and mentally. However, during a subsequent ploy in which Ultron replicated the fusion process on humans to transform them into cyborgs, Iron Man discovered the fusion process only imitated the human part, which indicated that Hank's side of Ultron Pym was just the simulation. The real Hank having died soon after the two were merged, and then Ultron had simply been possessing Hank's corpse ever since. But that's still terrifying. It's also ironic that Ultron was possessing Hank's corpse given that in a number one, Zombie Ant-Man. The Ant-Man of the Marvel Zombies universe that inspired the What If episode generated one of the most powerful variants of this character ever. Not only does Hank Pym retain his genius after becoming a zombie, he also retains control of his body and mind, aside from the whole like zombies desires thing, which I guess he was just fine with those. And he also keeps all of his powers. So he's now infected with the zombie virus that basically makes him virtually immortal, providing he avoids being destroyed, but he is also still Ant-Man, yeah. And also, destroying him is pretty tough, as the X-Men and many other superheroes find out, because of his density. The very strong and durable zombie Ant-Man was a terrifying force in the dystopian reality and killed many beloved Marvel heroes, his achievements including, but not limited to, eating Ego the living planet before being killed by the Sandman. Yeah, zombie Ant-Man legit ate an entire planet. Do you understand why he's number one now? Like, I, I get that like it, it was a sentient planet that wasn't exactly a planet, but like in the MCU at least he's like a celestial. So yeah, it's, it's pretty terrifying. I think. Number 10, Agent Anti-Venom. Everybody needs a good symbiote on their team, and if I was gonna pick one of them to put on my team, I think I'd be stupid to not pick Eugene Flash Thompson's Agent Venom. He is my favorite and probably the most reliable symbiotic superhero out there. The Savage Avengers had the benefit of getting the even better Agent Anti-Venom, which is basically the same thing with upgrades. So on top of the symbiotic powers awarded by the Venom symbiote, Agent Anti-Venom was also caustic to symbiotes, to the extent that prolonged physical contact will actually kill them. His touch also kills poisons and allows Flash to purge a person's body of impurities such as toxins and diseases. But unlike the original Anti-Venom, Flash can also heal physical injuries and doesn't have the random power negation effect. Flash's past as a soldier and boxer plus all his symbiotic enhancements make him someone you just don't want to mess with. Number 9, Damon Hellstrom. As the son of the devil, it would honestly be kind of weird if Damon Hellstrom, otherwise known as Hellstorm, didn't make this list. Damon was born when the demon Satan decided to have a child with a human woman as a way of accessing even greater power. So already we're off to a less than cheerful start. But luckily, after learning of his heritage, Hellstrom decided to turn his back on his father and vowed to fight against him, even eventually slaying his father and taking lordship over the dimension of hell. As a ruler of a dimension of hell and son of Satan, Hellstrom has a Cambian physiology and wields crazy magical abilities as well as commanding vast power in his own dimension, potentially meaning he can perform any magical feat. His physiology gives him super strength and durability and due to his dark soul, he has shape-shifting and teleportation abilities as well as magical awareness. Hellstrom has also wielded a trident made of netheranium, which is a psychosensitive metal found only in his extra-dimensional realm, and the weapon is a medium through which magical energies can be amplified and projected. I wish I knew more about him before making this list because he's honestly kind of really cool. Number 8, Weapon H. Clayton Cortez is actually a newer addition to the Marvel landscape, but in my opinion, he is pretty cool. Clayton was a Marine who, after defecting, was subjected to Weapon X's H Division, which was basically asking the question, what would happen if we mixed the Hulk and Wolverine and made them cyborgs? H Alpha, which was Clayton's designation, was different though. He retained more of his brain than the other subjects, and he was also not loyal to Director Stryker's cause. So, when this guy popped out of his incubation chamber, it didn't go too well for his creators. Are we surprised though? This Hulk Wolverine hybrid has an adamantium bonded skeleton, which still allows him to transform from human form to Hulk out form. And yes, he has an almost limitless level of strength and the insane level of durability afforded to the Hulk on top of the adamantium skeleton. And we haven't even got to the adamantium bone claws and studs, regenerative healing factor and enhanced senses. The one who created him, Dr. Alba, suggested that Weapon H could actually end the life of every living being on this earth. That's pretty insane. Number 7, Juggernaut. 
The stepbrother of Charles Xavier, Cain Marco, started off on the wrong foot as a bully to his brother. So he already wasn't nice when he gained the powers of irresistible force embodiment. This basically means that once Kane begins to advance in a certain direction, it is virtually impossible to halt his movement. Tons of rocks and plasma discharge cannons have slowed his pace, but they cannot completely halt him. Only a few things have ever been able to stop Juggernaut. Thor's use of his God Blast is one of them. War Hulk with increased strength thanks to Apocalypse's grafting celestial tech to him, which allowed Hulk to increase his strength and stop the Juggernaut, is another. Kane gained this ability after bonding to the Crimson Bands of Sidorak. Sidorak being an immensely powerful entity described as both a god and a demon. The bands also granted Kane with near limitless strength and stamina and gave him the ability to summon his mystical armor at a moment's notice. When Kane was the avatar of Sidorak, these powers were boosted to even greater heights, which is just a scary thought. Number 6, Ghost Rider. If there is one thing I have learned from my time on Earth so far, it would be that you never make deals with people who look like, sound like, or call themselves the devil. There are multiple instances of this happening in the backstory of stunt motorcyclist Johnny Blaze. His mother tried to make a deal with Mephisto that would stop Johnny becoming the spirit of vengeance thanks to a family curse, and that didn't go as planned. And then Johnny tried to make a deal with the same demon to save his surrogate father, which also did not go as planned and did not save him at all. Johnny was cursed with the power of the spirit of vengeance that inhabits his body, turning him into the Ghost Rider. While the Ghost Rider is in control, Johnny Blaze only influences its decisions to an extent as he takes the back seat, quote unquote. Doctor Strange has stated Johnny Blaze is simply a mortal and acts as a built-in safety, limiting the power of the Ghost Rider. Doctor Strange has also stated that when the demon Zarathos takes possession of the Ghost Rider, the Ghost Rider's power are, for most intents and purposes, boundless and quote unquote godlike. Those powers include superhuman strength with potential limitlessness, superhuman stamina, superhuman immunity to basically all earthly physical damage, superhuman agility, regenerative healing, supernatural awareness, hellfire manipulation including infusion, projection, and constructs, firestorms, sin and soul manipulation, hell cycle symbiosis, dimensional travel, demon magic, mystical fiery chain projection, size alteration, and his key ability, the penance stare, causing any individual who stares into his eyes to see and feel every bit of pain they have ever inflicted on anyone in their entire lifetime for all eternity. Number 5, Gorgon. I always forget that Gorgon was also Wolverine, but him being one of Norman Osborn's dark recruits and carrying the mantle would definitely make him one of the most powerful alternate versions of Wolverine around, because Gorgon is a pretty powerful and deadly guy. Even if, as we learned during the Otherworld tournament in Ten of Swords, he isn't immune to the seduction of rock sirens. Gorgon is a masterful fighter and a powerful mutant who also has the ability to turn his opponents to stone, hence his name. Gorgon. He is a deadly force to be reckoned with and I personally feel bad for all of the folks who have to challenge him whenever he's working security for the mutants of Krakoa. A lot of those people just are getting maimed left, right, and center. Ugh. Number 4, Dokken. Dokken or Akihiro is a deadly member of the Wolverine family who spent his time as Wolverine when he was on the Dark Avengers. It was during this time that Dokken attempted to take the Muramasa blade for himself to boost his power. He planned on having it bonded to his skeleton and coating his claws in it, and he wanted it so he could basically go kill Romulus. Remember Romulus everyone? Whatever happened with that? He was successful in bonding the Muramasa blade to his claws, but didn't get to hold on to that power permanently. He would go on to battle and defeat both Scar and the Punisher, in fact seemingly killing Frank Castle, who would then go on to become Frankencastle for a time. One of Dawkins' most powerful abilities is his pheromone control, which can allow him to alter his opponent's mood. This is actually how he won against Scar, using pheromones to calm Scar down, which caused him to then transform and transform in a way where he was just more chill. Number 3, Laura Kinney. Despite not even being an exact clone of Logan, X-23 is still one of the most powerful versions of Wolverine around out there. She became Wolverine in the all new Wolverine series. Even today, it's more the mantle and look that Laura is known for, with both her and Logan currently using the same name, Wolverine, on Krakoa. So there are two Wolverines technically within the same continuity now. More recently, Wolverine was chosen to go on a mission in 
inside the vault, along with Darwin and the resurrected Sink. The three were brought in to do so because of their extraordinary abilities and the fact that Sink could, in effect, use both of their powers himself. As we saw in issues 18 and 19 of the 2019 X-Men series, time moves differently in the vault. And in the end, the mission ended up taking, for them, hundreds of years before they actually managed to complete it and get out. But despite aging, Laura did not slow down. Even in the old woman Laura future where her cells were beginning to break down due to her being created originally from genetic engineering, Laura still proved to be a bad using her last bit of time alive to defeat Doom and free the people of Latveria. Basically all around, X-23 is just like the best. She's so cool. Number 2, Dark Claw. Dark Claw is a combination of Marvel's Wolverine and DC's Batman, hailing from the Amalgam Comics universe. So yeah, you know he's OP. He's not only got a powerful regenerative healing factor, but is a master fighter, martial artist, and detective who also happens to have super enhanced senses. Imagine a master detective who is also a master tracker. There is no crime or mystery that he could not solve. Dark Claw is also known for for being hyper intelligent besides, so he's basically got the whole package. He's also super wealthy in this reality as well, so he's got money to back up his vigilante antics, helping him to acquire high level tech and giving him access to various different gadgets, as well as his own claw copter, which this character has in place of a Batmobile. If you're both Wolverine and Batman, does that mean you just have like unlimited plot armor? Because I feel like both of those characters can never die just because they're so popular. So I feel like Dark Claw would be pretty unstoppable. Number one, Old Man Phoenix. Obviously, one of the most powerful versions of Wolverine around has to be the one from the alternate future of King Thor, Earth 14412. Here, Wolverine goes on to become the Phoenix after seemingly dying along with everyone else on Earth at the hands of Loki. The Phoenix, however, chose him, and because of that, he lived again and was given an unimaginable amount of cosmic power. Logan mostly used this power to fend off villains, including Ultron and Loki, and to keep the Space Stone out of Loki's hands. Many years later, as Old Man Phoenix, he would team up with King Thor to protect the Earth from Doctor Doom after it was given new life again. Doom in this reality was also immensely powerful, and although Logan could not be killed in battle, he chose to sacrifice himself to give Thor the power to defeat Doom, imbuing his hammer Mjolnir with the Phoenix Force. However, even after seemingly giving up his life here, he would still somehow end up being resurrected. Because Phoenix. Starting us off in at number 10, Super Soldier. We're starting off our list with a number that would be an awesome addition to the Avengers roster, but would feasibly never manage to even be considered for the team in the regular 616 universe. That's because he's an amalgamation of Steve Rogers and Superman. This is Super Soldier, a product of the combined DC Marvel amalgam universe in which various characters from each publisher were merged together to create new individuals. It's a neat concept, and it gave us a lot of interesting characters. Naturally, it makes sense that Captain America and Superman would make a great match for each other, with the hero gaining his abilities thanks to the Super Soldier formula, which was created thanks to cellular samples from an alien corpse. Little less of an inspiring superhero origin story, isn't it? He can do everything that Cap and Supes can do, so needless to say, that's impressive. But damned if DC would ever let him join a 616 Avengers team. Up next, number 9, Hawkeye 2099. A 2099 version of Hawkeye appeared in Secret Wars, and he's really dope. So 2099 is a Marvel Comics imprint that initially began being published in 1992 as one possible future in the Marvel Universe. It's meant to take place 100 years in the future, and was initially titled Marvel 2093, which clearly was a little less catchy. Anyway, this Hawkeye shows up in Secret Wars 2019 issue 1 from 2015 as part of Alchemex's Avengers team. Named Max, last name never revealed, he differs from the traditional iterations of Hawkeye by having his DNA mixed with a hawk's, which gave him real claws and real wings. In our number 8 spot we have Natasha Stark. Here we have an alternate version of Iron Man hailing from Earth 3490, and it's a unique one. This Iron Man is actually Iron Woman, born Natasha Stark rather than Tony. She's exactly like Tony in the sense of having the same abilities as the 616 Stark and an almost identical suit of armor, except it's referred to as her Iron Woman armor, of course. Here's where things get really interesting though. Because this alternate version of Stark is a woman, Civil War never happened. Instead, Natasha gets involved with Captain America Steve Rogers, the two marry, and the Civil War event never occurs on Earth 3490. 
Apparently, they were a deterrent to each other's more aggressive behavior. Natasha first appeared in Dark Reign Fantastic Four issue 2 in 2009 when Reed Richards was in search of alternate realities in which Civil War had ended differently. Moving on to our number 7 spot, we have Ant Man Wolverine. Yes, this exists. <laughs> Secret Wars gave us a slew of alternates of various characters, and this includes a version of Ant-Man who is Wolverine. Or rather, a version of Wolverine who operates under the Ant-Man mantle. First appearing in Secret Wars Battle World Issue 3, this little Logan has the same powers as those who have operated under the Ant-Man mantle. And tiny claws to boot! How fun. This Ant-Man Wolverine was one of many alternate versions of Wolverine who were brought together in an attempt to fight a pacifist version of Wolverine, aka Monk. By Mojo. Now, these other Wolverines involve another alias of Hank Pym's, Giant Man, who, as you guessed it, was a Wolverine who could also grow in size. There is also a Cat Wolverine and a Dog Wolverine, but kind of less credible than the rest of the other alternate Wolverines. Just saying. And at number six, Janet Van Dyne of Earth 1610. This version of the Wasp is from the Ultimate Universe of Earth 1610. While her fate is a pretty brutal one, and her relationship with Hank Pym is you know, textbook domestic abuse, she possesses something that Van Dyne of 616 does not, the ability to actually transform into a wasp-human hybrid. Born a mutant, her mutation gave her insect-like traits that also expanded to her behavior. She could lay eggs and eat insects, which yes, is kind of gross, but the benefits at least outweigh the downsides. When she would reduce in size via the force of her willpower, she would grow a pair of insect-like wings from her back. She retained her normal strength when reducing in size and could control the exact proportions of that size. Size, although her body contained a natural neurological reflex that prevented her from shrinking below a specific size, so can't get too small. And she also has an ability called bioelectrical blasts, in which she produces energy that she calls her wasp sings. She could use these blasts when at full size, which was essentially the equivalent of being struck by a lightning bolt. Moving on to number 5, A Fresh Start. In 2018, Marvel relaunched their comics with an event called Fresh Start. Now, Fresh Start saw the return of fan favorite characters like Tony Stark, Steve Rogers, Thor Odinson, Bruce Banner, and Logan aka Wolverine. Many of these characters post Civil War II had either died or moved on to something else, with legacy heroes taking their place and picking up their respective mantles. This relaunch also introduced a new incarnation of the West Coast Avengers. While Hawkeye still remained their leader, the second Hawkeye, Kate Bishop, was also on the team, along with Gwen Pool, America Chavez, Quentin Choir, and Kate's boyfriend Johnny Watts, aka Fuse. Johnny's sister Ramona Watts would also join up with the team during the series' run, and Kate's ex boyfriend, Novar, popped up as well. And of course, Gwen Pool would bring Jeff the Baby Landshark into the team in issue 8 after he first appeared in issue 7. And oh my god, Jeff the Landshark is like one of the greatest things ever. Another really neat aspect about the comic is that its narrative is broken up by reality television style interviews, in which we see the characters divulge to a crew various thoughts, feelings, etc. concerning the missions they go on and their interactions with other team members. It's kind of a neat twist. Moving on to number 4, Representation. The fresh start iteration of the West Coast Avengers are a very diverse cast, to say the least. But not just when it comes to the color of their skin. Multiple members identify as part of the queer spectrum, making it one of the biggest LGBTQ titles in Marvel's recent history. Ramon Watts, aka Alloy, is dating America Chavez. And now it seems that they aren't the token queer characters in the series because Ramon's brother, Johnny, who has been dating Kate Bishop, has declared his attraction to Novar, Kate's ex, who also declared a mutual attraction. The final issue of the series contained a few panels of the television crew interviewing Kate Bishop, Novar, and Fuse in which both Marvel Boy and Johnny reveal that they find the other one hot. Johnny says separately in his interview about Novar, he's pretty hot though. And Novar, in his, says, well, she's with Johnny and I have to respect that. And I can see what she sees in him. He's hot. And then we get a panel in which Kate is being interviewed, right after the crew inform her of what the two of her love interests have said, to which she responds, wait, have I ever even dated anyone straight? To which the crew responds with, Nope. Moving on to number 3, US Agent. While the Avengers generally refused to tango with the government, the West Coast Avengers were always open to the outside influence. As time went on, the US government became more involved in the team, to the extent that Hawkeye was actually briefly replaced as their leader by a Steve Rogers carbon copy US Agent. Several members of the team quit because of this, and the West Coast Avengers actually gained more enemies due to his involvement. Eventually he was booted out, thankfully, but it did cause quite the stir up for the team at the time. Moving on to number 2, Force War. Remember how we mentioned that Avengers West Coast was cancelled in 1994? Well, this is what was created to replace it. 
Force Works, a ridiculously 90s series that took the remains of the West Coast Avengers team, but was led by Iron Man who wanted to establish a team that wouldn't only fight crime, but would also prevent disasters from occurring. Tell that to his Civil War self. Scarlet Witch was the leader of the team which consisted of War Machine, Spider Woman, Cybermancer, US Agent, Moonraker, and Wonder Man who was later replaced by Sentry. This team's story arcs would eventually lead into one of the worst Avengers storylines of all time, Avengers The Crossing, in which it was revealed that Tony Stark was actually under the influence of Kang the Conqueror, but then it was revealed to actually be his future self Immortus in disguise. And then he was killed off altogether and replaced by a younger version of himself from an alternate reality. This then bled into Heroes Reborn, which was yet another highly disliked story arc. And finally, in at number 1, Cancelled Again. Clearly, cancellation is nothing New to the West Coast Avengers. The latest iteration of the West Coast Avengers, the Fresh Start Gang, were cancelled after 10 issues, ending with West Coast Avengers issue 10, much to many fans' dismay. But while the series is coming to an end, it seems as if the team will live on. Guest starring in another Marvel series, Superior Spider Man. Number 10, Iron Goblin. Iron Goblin was a version of Tony that was kind of combined with Green Goblin through being exposed to the Goblin Serum in order to save his life. This saved him from the spider virus, but also made him insane like Norman Osborne. Born. This version of Tony Stark ultimately decided to sacrifice himself for others, not wanting to completely lose his sanity, and as a means of making amends for all the bad that he had done in his life prior to becoming Iron Man. As Iron Goblin, he wielded the Ebony Blade, attempting to buy some time for the Resistance to escape from the Spider Army on Spider Island, which if you didn't know is all part of Battle World, Secret Wars, all that good stuff. Number 9, Old Iron Man. This version of Tony Stark is actually the original original from the comics who died after it was revealed in the crossing event that he was actually evil. Dun dun dun. This version of Tony was a sleeper agent for Kang the Conqueror who had brainwashed him into basically becoming evil and becoming a villain. Even the Avengers couldn't stand up to Iron Man alone here. They recruited a younger version of the hero from the past to join them in their fight against older Iron Man. Unfortunately, this only resulted in younger and less experienced Tony getting his butt whooped and nearly being killed by his older self. In the end, older Iron Man was defeated when he basically saw the light and decided to return to the side of good, sacrificing himself and also creating a chest plate before doing so in order to stabilize his younger self who would then go on to take his place. That's a real thing that happened. Ah, <laughs> oh, The Crossing. What a time. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list, if you want to learn about more awesome alternate versions of Iron Man, be sure to show us by giving this video a like. Give it a little thumbs up. And uh, definitely do that because there's lots of alternate versions of Iron Man that I still haven't mentioned. I didn't think... I was gonna be super into Iron Man and that I would have all these alternates on my mind that I wanted to talk about, but it's actually a lot that I still haven't talked about. A lot of great ones. A lot of a lot of lady Iron Mans as well that we haven't talked about. Iron Woman's, Iron Women's, I don't know. Number 8, Superior Iron Man. While this is still Tony Stark from the main continuity, Stark also kind of erased this version of himself from his brain in order to this is so complicated. I love it. While this is still Tony Stark from the main continuity, Stark also kind of erased this version of himself from his brain in order to protect important information from falling into the hands of Hammer's director, Norman Osborn at the time during Dark Reign. So for that reason, I'm going to count him, because he kind of erased this version of himself even though it all happened in main continuity. Superior Iron Man or Evil Tony Stark was created during the events of Axis, when heroes and villains had their alignments flipped. So heroes became villains and villains became heroes. It was a weird but overall fun time in terms of what the characters got up to. Tony managed to shield himself from having his alignment return to normal and, in secret, kept his alignment evil. <laughs> this version of Tony had no moral code holding him back and at one point almost successfully took over San Francisco with the creation of a phone app and a little bit of extremists. True story. Well, maybe a lot of extremists, because it went into the water supply. But still, I think it's impressive if you can be like, here's an app, it's free. Now it's $100 a day! That's crazy. Sorry, $99.99. 
because that's a more appeasing um, price to the eye. Did you know? Number seven, Iron Man 2.0. This was a name that Rhodey took up later on as a version of Iron Man who served the government. But Tony Stark's BFF, James Rhodes, actually took up the mantle of Iron Man way before that in the comics as well. Back when he was known just as Iron Man. Of course, with this being an alternate list, I thought just calling him you know, just Iron Man might be confusing. So I took the later editorial name that was used in the comics when he was Iron Man another time. Rhodey ended up taking over as Iron Man actually way back in the 80s in the comics after Tony's alcoholism was getting in the way and making it difficult for him to act as a hero responsibly. And Rhodey actually stayed as Iron Man for quite some time, while Tony took time off to relax and recover. Rhodey was an impressive Iron Man, but would eventually be forced to give up the mantle due to headaches that he suffered as a side effect of the suit not being properly calibrated to his brain patterns. Which honestly, I feel like if you're taking over as Iron Man, that should probably be a step that happens. Like, it's kind of rude that Tony didn't think about that. These headaches made him overly aggressive and irritable, forcing Tony to reclaim the mantle once more. Because it was too dangerous, but he'd be Iron Man again later, so. Yay! Number 6, Iron Man 2020. This version of Iron Man is the brother of Tony Stark and the legitimate child of Howard and Maria Stark. Because as we'd later find out, Tony was adopted. But before that happened, they had Arno. Arno had to be hidden away for years because he was sick and in danger. But once that was somewhat resolved, it's kind of a long story, Tony ended up learning of his existence and reached out to meet his brother. Arno Stark is also known for his brilliant intellect like his brother. In fact, he has even claimed to be smart smarter than Tony in the past, which I don't know, but I personally think that it could be true. Arno successfully modified the extremist virus, attempting to turn it into a cure-all, and at one point using it to increase the Hulk's intelligence dramatically. Arno was also convinced at one point while operating as Iron Man that the only way to ensure peace between AI and organic life forms was to seize control of both sides' minds. Fortunately, he was stopped in this pursuit by his brother, Tony Stark. And I think now he's just like living in some sort of simulation that Tony put him in to, uh, yeah, just make him feel like a hero while he's like, I'm just gonna do this while we figure out how to not have you be around and be kind of evil. That would be good. Arno just thought he was doing what was best. I don't know what's wrong with that. Number five, the Scarlet Spider. Ben Riley first appeared in Amazing Spider-Man issue 149 as a clone. He was part of the whole clone thing that went on for way too long, way too long. But it wasn't until Spider-Man issue five that he was introduced to readers as the Scarlet Spider. Now the Jackal created the clone using Peter's DNA. and He was made to fight Peter, of course. He's like, hey, you can't beat him, just clone him. Now the two were fighting it out in order to save Ned from a bomb. And then when the clone seemingly died, he was soon buried after, but the thing is, the Jackal injected him with something earlier so he could survive something like this. Of course! Of course. So for the next five years, he thought of himself as the useless clone that came back to life, then gave himself the name Ben Riley. So depressed. Perhaps one of the better elements to come from the clone saga was Ben Riley. One of the few things. Number four, Spider-Man 2099. Ah yes, the not so near future. 2099 Spider-Man, AKA Miguel O'Hara is the current web slinger over there. And his outfit is one of the more memorable ones. His DNA was biologically mixed with a spider's DNA. So it's a little bit different than our spider bite scenario that we have. Now he worked at Alchemex and was pressured by the company to test genetic coding. And after Mr. Sims didn't make one of those test runs, just went horrible, Miguel was then poisoned by Tyler Stone with a fatal drug named Rapture. So Miguel ended up relying on the drug so much that he couldn't quit his job. How brutal is that? It's like every McDonald's employee. It's like, hey, you want free nuggets? Yeah, sign in tomorrow. You're not going anywhere. So Miguel ended up relying on the drug so much that he tried to genetically fix himself and fix his body. Now, of course, this had a brighter turnout than expected, but Miguel inherited Spider-Man abilities plus telepathy. Must be nice. Number three, the Spider. Earth 15 Spider-Man, simply referred to as the Spider, comes into comics during the Exile storyline issue 12. Now he was another Cletus Cassidy, pretty much. I mean, he was a red-haired psycho who had no problem taking out innocent people. So when the Spider symbiote came along in this Earth, it merged with Evil Peter, who was sentenced to not one, not two, but 67 life sentences from a jury. 
Okay, so he's bad. He was a big part of the Weapon X team, and he had Deadpool's sense of humor too, which made him just that much more evil. Now in Exiles issue 44, he was finally stopped by Firestar when she hit him with a mega blast. He was later buried in the prison cemetery, so even after death, you're still doing that time. Number two, Miles Morales. Of course, we gotta talk about him. He made his first appearance in Ultimate Fallout issue four, just a couple months right before the death of Peter Parker. Now this is a crazy time because Norman Osborn was just arrested and revealed as the Green Goblin, and while Miles was visiting his uncle Aaron, an enhanced spider crawled out of Aaron's bag, bit Miles, and Bob's your uncle. You know the rest. Now, we got these amazing Spider-Man abilities, but he could also camouflage himself almost fully invisible. Plus, Venom Blast will help get the job done, that's for sure. The new PlayStation Spider-Man game is way more fun with these added abilities. Makes it way better, so I had to put them on this list and talk about them. Especially, we're talking about abilities. Hold L1 and just punch someone's chest through the wall, you're like, yeah, this is great. And finally, number one, Cosmic Spider-Man, AKA Captain Universe. This Spider-Man is one of, if not the most powerful alternate version of the Web Slinger. Cosmic Spider-Man went toe to toe with Rune King Thor and came out on top. So if you're not sold now, just get out of here. Actually, don't get out of here. Watch the rest of the video. Don't even say that, Never mind. Cosmic Spider-Man is from Earth 13. He retains the powers of the Enigma Force and he first appears in Amazing Spider-Man Volume 3 Issue nine. Cosmic Spider-Man can't leave his universe or else he would lose the Enigma Force. That's why the resistance of spider heroes were based in Central Park of Earth 13. They're like, hey, no sweat, we'll come to you, no problem. We don't mind the commute. <laughs> he meets his demise only a couple issues later, sadly, when the Inheritors were hunting down Spider-Man and their leader, Solus, drained the Enigma Force from him. But we can find more of him in What If Volume 2, Issue 31, titled What If Spider-Man Had Kept His Cosmic Powers, which I may or may not touch on in my next video. We'll see, stay tuned. It's a good one. Number 10, Justice. Also known as Vance Astrovic, he has latent mutant telekinesis powers that were activated when he encountered his future self, Major Victory of the Guardians of the Galaxy. The Major also traveled back in time and across realities to prevent himself from ever acquiring powers, but instead just activated them early and created an alternate timeline. Man, talk about being your own worst enemy. He accidentally killed his father and went to prison, and during this time, learned to respect the law, even helping the guards during an uprising. When he was released, he had a new outlook on life and named himself Justice, becoming a hero. He has been a member of the New Warriors and later the Avengers, discovering a new way to defeat Ultron and helping them defeat him. His main power is his telekinesis, although he was once a fighter in the UCWF, Unlimited Class Wrestling Federation, where he was known as Manglin John Mahoney. Hey guys, if you like these videos and you want to see more, be sure to take a second and hit that like button. Number nine, Black Knight. Dane Whitman is actually the third character to bear the Black Knight name, and he first appeared in The Avengers number 47 in 1967. Nephew to the original Black Knight, he inherited a mystical sword that carried a curse and fought to restore honor to the Black Knight name. He uses a winged horse named Aragorn as his mount and as an Avenger helped the team take on Kang the Conqueror. An excellent swordsman with magic senses, he has been a member of many other teams including the Heroes for Hire and the Ultra Force. He had a four issue miniseries in 1990 and was the main character of his own series that was cancelled after a short time. If Black Knight is an Avenger that you have have heard of, then good news for you, he'll be appearing in the upcoming Marvel film Eternals in 2021, played by Kit Harington. If you've seen Game of Thrones, then I'm sure you'll agree he's a great choice. Can't wait to see Jon Snow in the MCU. Number 8, Two Gun Kid. In 1948, Marvel released their first ever Western comic book, Two Gun Kid. An expert gunslinger, wrongly accused of murder, he spends his life on the run, but does good everywhere he goes. Just him, his two six guns, and his trusty guitar. Marvel had great success with this and went on to create a whole slew of western themed comics, but I'll bet the kid never thought he would one day be riding alongside men in tights as a member of the Avengers. The kid met the Avengers when they went up against the time traveling villain Kang in 1870 and got along really well with Hawkeye, so he just joins up and helps them take on Kang. Afterwards, he returns to the 20th century with the Avengers. In the modern era, he works alongside She-Hulk, hoping to become her colleague since she works at a law firm, but quickly realizes he'll never be able to catch up on all the new laws and instead becomes a bounty hunter. He rides around in an awesome jet cycle named Lightning, which he uses to fly around the city. Number seven, Hellcat. Real name Patricia Walker. You might recognize her from Marvel's Netflix shows where she is guest starred, but did you know she was also once an Avenger? Hellcat joined up with the Avengers in 1976 
but actually had her own teen romantic comedy series before this called Miss America Magazine in 1944. Similar to Two Gun Kid, this is a popular character that sort of slowly evolved into a superhero. She appears again in 1977 in The Defenders, where she meets the son of Satan, and the two later become married, a husband and wife occult investigation team. She is a well-trained martial artist and gymnast, with wrist-mounted claws and grappling hooks. Surprisingly, she has appeared in five different Marvel video games, including LEGO Avengers. Number 6, Moon Dragon. Heather Douglas was a young girl driving through the desert with her parents when Thanos' spaceship landed on Earth. Not wanting witnesses, he blew up their car, but Heather was thrown from the vehicle and survived. Her father's corpse is later reanimated to create Drax the Destroyer. Thanos' father, Mentor, found her and took her to his homeworld Titan, where she studied the Titan's ways and unlocked her latent psychic potential. However, she becomes influenced by the Dragon of the Moon, and believing she has success resisted its influence, takes on the name Moon Dragon. She was present when the Avengers confronted Korvac, using her powers to see into his mind while they fought. She later joins the Defenders alongside Valkyrie, and discovers she's still being influenced by the Dragon of the Moon. She manages to resist it for real this time, but as they are separated, she begins to die from mutated spores, and the Dragon appears again, offering to save her life if she agrees to be its host. She does agree, and then, as an evil dragon, Dragon fights against the defenders until the four of them sacrifice themselves to kill both her and the dragon. Number 5. War Machine War Machine is James Rhodes, who became a close friend to Iron Man and ended up being gifted a suit of armor from Tony to use in his own heroic adventures. He would end up being recruited and serve on the revived Avengers project as a member of the team during their first mission where they attempted to defeat and capture Red Skull. Rhodey happened to be armed with a nuke to use against the Red Skull as part of a last resort plan, if needed. But the Red Skull had overheard about this plan and said nuke, and so managed to disable it easily using the Cosmic Cube. Honestly, if the Red Skull didn't have the Cosmic Cube though at this time, my money would have definitely been on War Machine in this fight, because War Machine I think he's pretty powerful. War Machine would also for a time gain temporary Hulk-like powers after being given some of Tyrone Cash's Hulk serum. Number 4. Nerd Hulk While Nerd Hulk is a very powerful character in terms of his abilities being on the same level of power as Bruce Banner's Hulk from her 1610, he tends to end up being not so powerful in actuality when battling other people. This is because he has a tendency to hold back though. Nerd Hulk is a clone that Gregory Stark, Tony Stark's brother, created. Nerd Hulk prefers to try and resolve conflicts using logic as opposed to violence, and it is the marriage of his intellect and strength combined that holds him back from being as deadly as he could be. Still, the potential is there, and he does have access to the same amount of strength and ferocity as Banner if he'd only feel inclined to use it. Nerd Hulk was a member of the Avengers team when they were first resurrected and went after Red Skull. He would also later attempt to join the Ultimates, but he was denied membership. Sad. Poor Nerd Hulk. I love him with his little glasses. Number 3. Gregory Stark Gregory Stark is like the evil brother of Tony Stark. He is the more immoral of the two when it comes to technology, but is more put together overall in comparison to his brother. Much less of a mess, if you will. This obviously made him a valuable asset to S.H.I.E.L.D. and Nick Fury, and so he ended up on the Avengers team. However, Gregory was also super smart, and was using his time working with S.H.I.E.L.D. to put certain plans into action that would allow him to take over control and eventually kind of ruled the world, sort of. After Fury seemingly went rogue and Carol Danvers was also removed from the chessboard, Gregory was made the new director of S.H.I.E.L.D. and attempted to use his influence and nanite tech to cause chaos and war to erupt in other nations. Fortunately, he would be defeated by his brother, Tony, who disabled his nanites with an EMP, allowing Thor to take him down. Still, for a time, Gregory was a pretty valuable member of the Avengers team and later a formidable villain to them and to the Ultimates. And for that, he gets some bonus points. That's what I say. Gold Star Gregory Stark. That's what I call him. For evilness, I guess.
Number 2. Tyrone Cash Tyrone Cash was a fairly powerful version of the Hulk, and actually was the first Hulk to exist in the Ultimate Universe. He created the Hulk serum before his protege Bruce Banner was able to, and decided to use it on himself. This gave him massive strength and he took the name Tyrone Cash, and decided to become a criminal, using his brilliant intellect to avoid capture for longer than a decade. Previously, he had been known as the scientist and as Banner's mentor, Professor Leonard Williams. Eventually, Cash was apprehended and forced to join the Avengers team, and after S.H.I.E.L.D. learned that he'd betrayed them, Fury had him executed. So of course, who's the most powerful? Who could it be? Number 1. Nick Fury When it comes to the Avengers team, Nick Fury is like the Amanda Waller of it all, in comparison to the Ultimate Avengers DC counterpart, which would likely be the Suicide Squad. Nick Fury was the one to resurrect Project Avengers, and while he claimed this was done to hunt down the Red Skull, Captain America's villainous son in this reality, it is actually believed that Fury had orchestrated Red Skull's return in order to get his job back as Director of S.H.I.E.L.D. and resurrect the old abandoned Avengers project. That's just so Nick Fury, I'm just saying. Nick Fury holds a lot of power not just as a master spy who often deals in secrets, but also because he was exposed to the super soldier serum and has influence over the rest of the Avengers team as their overall leader and organizer. He's just got a lot of power. He's also like got a million plans, so if you're like, oh I know how we'll beat Nick Fury, he probably already has a plan for if you try to do that to him. That's how good he is. Number 10. Rancor Rancor is the descendant of Wolverine who hails from the Earth of 691. She first appeared in the original Guardians of the Galaxy series in issue number 8. When she was just a teenager, she battled her own father and defeated him by clawing out his heart. Yikes. She then took over the planet Haven and decided to take prisoner the human population of that planet, turning them into her servants against their will. She would cross paths and play villain to the original Guardians of the Galaxy team initially, but they would end up defeating her this time around at least. Her powers are similar to Wolverine's, being that she is his descendant. As a ruler, she also has other warriors at hand who are willing to fight for her, although she herself is also a capable and skilled fighter. Number 9. Albert Albert was an android created to destroy the real Wolverine by Donald Pierce. He came from a kind of wacky time in comics and also worked with LCD, another android who resembled a little girl. Like I said, it was an interesting and strange time. In the end, both LCD and Albert would go rogue, deciding not to complete their mission as they developed their own free will and thought and decided that they didn't want to die. In killing Wolverine, they likely would have been forced to self-destruct, which they just were not into. Albert the android has powers very similar to Wolverine, though he doesn't self heal. But hey, he's an android, so he can be rebuilt or patched up in most cases if he's harmed. He also has the fighting prowess to almost match Wolverine of 616, almost, and also possesses a genius level intellect, supposedly. Number 8. Wolverine Earth 811 the Wolverine of Earth 811 is interesting as it has been implied that his powers, while similar to the version of Wolverine from Earth 616, could have actually just been a result of human evolution, with him potentially being a descendant of a small group of ancestors known as the Moon Clan, who hid when the Celestials first arrived at Earth, avoiding any of their genetic experimentation. Despite these potential origins, Wolverine was still considered a mutant when the Sentinels took over as he hails from the reality of Earth 811. And of course, Earth 811 is the reality of the days of future past. He was the Wolverine to help Magneto rescue Scarlet Witch, but unfortunately she died during that attempt and Magneto ended up paralyzed from the waist down. Wolverine would go on to join the resistance and become a leader among them, so he not only brings with him his own abilities, but influence over the resistant forces located on his earth in his reality. Number 7. Jimmy Hudson Jimmy is the son of Wolverine from the Ultimate Universe of Earth 1610, though Jimmy wouldn't know he was Wolverine's son until his mutant powers manifested. His powers are similar to his dad's, but Jimmy is also bonded to one of the poisons, a kind of symbiotic alien creature that typically takes over their hosts. However, after their leader died, Jimmy found a way to control his poison. While bonded to his poison, Jimmy also has spider-like abilities and can shapeshift, turning his claws into tensile, goo-like tendrils or extremely elongated spikes. 
whatever he prefers for the day. Number 6, X24. X24 was a clone of Logan made to defeat the old man version of him and recapture the clones who had escaped. He was powerful enough to take on both old man Logan and Laura Kinney at the same time. And Logan pretty much dies trying to fight him in the end, and X24 is even then only killed after X23 is forced to shoot him with an adamantium bullet that Wolverine was actually saving for himself to end his own life. X24 is one tough dude in this movie. He is a version of Logan whose rage is more tapped into and unleashed. What's more, he was engineered to be comparable to Logan in terms of his power level, but in peak physical condition. Considered to be like Wolverine, but as he was in his prime. Number 5, Danielle Cage. Danielle Cage is the future daughter of Jessica Jones and Luke Cage. This could be who the future little 616 Danielle Cage ends up as, or maybe not. Only time will tell if Danielle ends up having a similar future to this alternate version of herself and Captain America, or not. In this reality of Earth 15061, Danielle Cage grows up to become the hero Captain America, possessing the abilities of both her father and her mother, meaning she is both super strong and super durable and can fly, all that good stuff you've come to know and love from both Luke and Jessica's heroic power sets. As Captain America in the future, she also has inherited and wields the Captain America shield. Number 4, MCU Captain America. I mean, of course MCU Captain America has to make our cut. The Marvel Cinematic version of the character is not only extremely popular, but it's also deemed worthy enough to lift Thor's hammer, giving us that awesome fight scene in Avengers Endgame where Thor and Captain America are switching back and forth, alternating between sharing and wielding Mjolnir and Stormbreaker. This ultimately gives Cap a big, big power boost, being able to wield Thor's weapons, especially considering that Thor is one of the most powerful members of the Avengers team, in part because of his powerful, magical, and also kind of cosmic weapons. Number 3, Carol Danvers. That's right, Carol at one point managed to become Captain America. This has actually happened in more than one reality, but for this list, we're going to focus on the version of Carol Cap that comes from the Venomverse. She appears as Captain America in Venomverse War Stories and hails from the same reality as Venom Rocket, Earth 18197. In the story she appears in, Captain America Carol Danvers and Venom Rocket battle it out as Rocket is looking to cash in on a bounty for the Kree who want Carol Danvers. Venom Rocket and Captain America seem pretty evenly matched here, but in the end, Rocket does not manage to capture Carol, and Carol seemingly ends up the victor of that match, though undoubtedly left with a pretty big mess to clean up as a result of their destructive battle. Carol Danvers' as Captain America still seemingly possesses some version of her Kree physiology and her 616 power set here, making her a pretty powerful alternate version of Captain America. Number 2, Super Soldier. Super Soldier hails from the Amalgam universe. Stories and characters created using the combined lore of DC Comics main roster of superheroes and villains and Marvel Comics main roster of superheroes and villains. Super Soldier himself is an alternate version created by combining the heroes Captain America from Marvel and Superman from DC. Clark Kent ended up in the Super Soldier program during World War II, which used alien DNA taken from a corpse that was discovered to alter Clark Kent permanently granting him superhuman powers. He is the combined power set of both Cap and Supes, making him pretty crazy powerful, although he also comes with his own highly dangerous villain as well, the Green Skull, and his own weakness to the ore known as Green K. So keep in mind, he does have that weakness. Number 1, Soldier Supreme. Soldier Supreme is what you get when you combine the mystical powerhouse of Doctor Strange with the all-American war hero Captain America. The result is a character who happens to be tough, strong, fast, and a gifted fighter while also possessing tons of mystical knowledge and abilities. Soldier Supreme hails from Warp World, the reality created by Gamora when she folded the universe in half using the power of the Infinity Stones. Here, Steve Rogers participated in the Super Soldier program which was really a front for something less scientific and more magical in nature. Conducting a series of rituals, Dr. Morgan Erskine transformed Steven Rogers into the Soldier Supreme. Number 10, Dark Avengers. The Dark Avengers were first introduced in their own comic book series in Dark Avengers issue number one. Not everyone is a fan of them, because while they're kind of Avengers, they're also kind of go against a lot of the things that the original team stood for. The Dark Avengers are led by Norman Osborn, who gets to make his own organization, Hammer to safeguard the world's safety following the crumbling of S.H.I.E.L.D. and after his victory against the Skrull Queen, whose death was brought about by Osborn and was also televised, making him a worldwide hero in the eyes of many. Despite
despite the fact that, yeah, he was still definitely a villain. Still, although this team was comprised of villains, they did aim to do good things, just in their own way. In truth, they became more a team of anti-heroes than anything, with just a dash of villainous escapades organized by their leader, Osborne, who at this point went by Iron Patriot. Sort of like the Iron Man of this Dark Avengers crew. Number 9. Avengers Academy Avengers Academy was a series that replaced the Avengers The Initiative series. As that series ended, this one began. The Avengers Academy team was a group of super powered youths who were selected to be trained as new Avengers. Although originally the teens thought that they had been selected due to the promise that they showed, it was later revealed that they had been selected because of the great risk that they would ultimately become villains. In fact, six of the teens were actually working for Norman Osborn during the Dark Avengers Hammer Dark Rain days and likely could have ended up up being trained by him to become Dark Avengers, should that whole situation have continued to play out. However, when the Avengers found out about them, they instead decided to create the Avengers Academy in an attempt to repurpose and redeem those youths, so basically took them in themselves. Hank Pym acted as the headmaster of this academy, while Tigra, Justice, Quicksilver, and Speedball took on roles as teachers. Number 8. Secret Avengers This team operated for three years in the comics. It was led by Commander Steve Rogers and Sharon Carter. After the solution of Hammer and the Dark Avengers, Steve was now left to decide what should come after. Instead of reforming S.H.I.E.L.D. or the Avengers, he decided to secure global safety through the use of various smaller Avengers teams. Secret Avengers was one of those teams that he himself led and was a black ops unit used for covertly dealing with the problems that Osborn, Hammer, and the Dark Avengers had left behind and created during their reign. Members included Black Widow, Ant-Man, Beast, Moon Knight, War Machine, Nova and a Valkyrie named Brunhilde. They were eventually disbanded by Hawkeye following their fight against the Descendants. But man, was it a fun and weird run. Seriously, if you haven't checked out Secret Avengers, you should maybe do it. It's pretty strange. I kind of love it. Number 7. Mighty Avengers Granted, there is more than one Mighty Avengers team, but for the purpose of this list, we're talking about Luke Cage's Mighty Avengers. This team of Avengers formed to look after the Earth after the main Avengers team was forced to roll out when the Builders threatened the entire universe. Yeah, that was a thing. Remember that? During the Avengers absence, Thanos returned to Earth and the Mighty Avengers stepped in to protect their people and their planet. The team was led by Luke Cage and included such heroes as Spectrum, White Tiger, and Blue Marvel, as well as Superior Spider-Man, who at one point attempted to overtake leadership of the team, fighting Luke Cage for it. Number 6. AIM I know what you're thinking, AIM? Wait, but what? AIM was originally the villainous organization of genius level scientists, also known as Advanced Idea Mechanics, who aimed, <laughs> get it, aimed, to overthrow the government and rule the world using technological advancements. So what are you talking about, Amanda? How can they be an Avengers team? Well, this organization eventually was taken over by mutant and hero Sunspot, Roberto da Costa. Sunspot renamed the organization Avengers Idea Mechanics and set up to reclaim and reform it. He used the organization for good, filling it with more noble, brilliant minds who developed tech to help with Sunspot's new Avengers rescue missions. Roberto basically merged his new Avengers team with AIM to create this new technologically advanced Avengers team. Previously, that new Avengers team was actually known as the Multiversal Avengers, and originally they were all about discovering the reason behind the gradual disintegration of the multiverse. Number 5. Zombie Avengers In Avengers Age of Ultron, published in 2015, we are introduced to a Marvel Universe based off of the popular cinematic universe that features everyone's favorite heroes. In this universe, after the Chitauri invasion of New York City, a zombie shows up at Tony Stark's birthday party. The zombie is killed by Black Widow, but not before its infection is spread through touch to Thor and Black Widow. The Avengers attempt to keep the zombified heroes contained while Tony and Bruce Banner head out in search of a cure. Thor escapes and he goes after some of the other Avengers and this leads into the storyline called Zombies Assemble, published in 2007, originally a manga but then later adapted into English for the Western audience. Number 4. Defunct Avengers Next Avengers, Heroes of Tomorrow, came out in 2008, and in it, everything starts out great. Our heroes have defeated all of their foes, and they all have normal lives, starting families and having children. But when Ultron shows up, our heroes race to hide and protect their children, which they succeed at, but then end up dying themselves. Except for Thor, who returns to rule Asgard after his father's death. 
It's a long road as Iron Man and Vision work together to seek out the children of the Avengers and raise a new generation of Avengers, eventually defeating Ultron with some help from the Incredible Hulk. Number three, Hulk Avengers. In Long Shot Saves the Marvel Universe, we see some crazy variations of Marvel characters. This series, published in 2014, features a team known as the Hulk Avengers, made up of Captain America, Iron Man, Thor, and Hawkeye. It's worth noting that these guys are antagonists in the story, along with Wilson Fisk wielding the Affinity Gauntlet, Vampire King Wolverine, and a Venom version of the Punisher. We also see Otto Octavius trapped in Spider-Man's body, and a version of Kraven the Hunter hosting the Phoenix Force. It's a dark and twisted take on everyone, and you can tell that the creators had a lot of fun making it. Did I mention there's a werewolf Captain America? Number two, Tyrant Avengers. This version of the Avengers appeared in Avengers Volume 5 in 2014. Their reality was destroyed, and they were brought to the Marvel Prime Universe by Advanced Idea Mechanics. They escape from AIM Island and arrive in New York realizing that they're actually in an alternate universe. Thor notices some humans nearby, not on their knees as they should be, and decides to kill them and teach them a lesson. Eventually, these guys end up squaring off against the real Avengers in an epic showdown. In the end, AIM stealthily captures both teams and these bad guys get sent off to their own world, Earth 83292. Maybe we'll check in with them in a future Marvel story. And now, number one, Revengers. In Realm of Kings number one, released in 2009, we meet the Revengers, Avengers of the Cancerverse, corrupted by Lord Marvel. The Cancerverse is a reality where life defeated death, resulting in eternal life, but not the good kind. The entire universe is a living corpse kind. In this story, a Terragen bomb is launched by the Inhumans of Earth 616 and creates an opening between Earth and the Cancerverse. Lord Marvel leads an invasion hoping to expand the Cancerverse. The Revengers are super dark and scary, and most notably we see Bruce Banner sporting some huge horns, Carol Danvers with a creepy third eye, and Captain America with stars that look suspiciously like pentagrams. You would be hard pressed to find a darker version of Earth's Mightiest Heroes. Number 10, Miss Marvel. Miss Marvel was once Carol Danvers and is now Kamala Khan. And of course, for this list, we're focusing on Kamala, who was a new addition to the Avengers team in 2015, after making her first unnamed appearance only two years earlier in 2013 in the comics. Kamala is a huge Carol Danvers fan, which is what inspired her to take up the mantle Miss Marvel after Carol dropped it taking up the Captain Marvel mantle instead herself. Kamala as Miss Marvel has powers which allow her to alter her body's physiology, allowing her to stretch, change size and shape, and in theory, straight up shapeshift. Her powers come from inhuman heritage, which was activated by her exposure to the Terrigen Bomb. Kamala joined the team for a time during all new, all different Avengers, and remains a fan favorite hero at Marvel Comics. And to clarify before we move on to point nine, this is gonna be a list of Avengers that have recently come on to the team as opposed to new Avengers, which is kind of its own thing. There's a lot of new Avengers, so I just wanted to clarify that. Number 9, Wasp. Not the same Wasp who years ago was actually the leader of the Avengers for a while. Nuh uh, we are not talking about Janet Van Dyne here. We are talking about Nadia Van Dyne, who, despite her seemingly misleading name, is actually the daughter of Hank Pym and his first wife, Maria Travoya. After her mother Maria was kidnapped and later killed, Nadia ended up being raised in the Red Room, considered a valuable asset due to her natural aptitude for science and academia, believed to be somewhat in part due to the fact that she was. Was Hank's naturally born daughter. Nadia would eventually escape the Red Room and attempt to locate her father in the US, only to find out that he had recently died during a fight against Ultron. Nadia felt compelled to meet her stepmother, Janet, desiring to become the new Wasp. The two ended up getting along well, and Janet even gave Nadia her blessing to take her last name, seeing her as family. Hence, Nadia became both Nadia Van Dyne and the new Wasp, also going on to join the Avengers team. Number 8, Spider Man. Peter Parker Parker as Spider-Man has of course teamed up with the Avengers before, but Miles Morales as Spider-Man is a newer addition, not just in terms of the Avengers team, but also still relatively new in terms of him existing in 616. Miles Morales is originally a Spider-Man who hails from the Ultimate Comics line originating in Earth 1610, the Ultimate Universe. He was given a new home on Earth 616 after his world had been destroyed as a result of showing kindness to and sharing food with Molecule Man during the Secret Wars event. 
True story. Thank goodness for pocket cheeseburgers. Miles has a power set very similar to Peter's in many ways, but also has a few unique abilities of his own. He can shock his opponents with venom blasts and can sneak up on them with his spider camouflage, which he can use to appear invisible. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want to learn about even more newest additions to the Avengers we've seen in recent years, be sure to give this video a thumbs up. Number 7. Valkyrie Valkyrie is Jane Foster, who was originally known as Thor when she joined the Avengers team the first time around. Jane ended up becoming the new Thor after Thor Odinson, the original Thor, was deemed unworthy. As the new Mighty Thor, editorially referred to at times as Lady Thor, Jane joined the Avengers team in the all new, all different Avengers series in 2015. Currently in the comics, Jane is no longer the Mighty Thor, but was welcomed into Asgardia by Odin, who gave her a new title and power set, making her a new Valkyrie. To clarify, I'm saying Asgardia because she was kind of like welcome to the whole world of Asgard, but she didn't like go like live on Asgard or anything specific like that. Currently, Valkyrie is the mantle that she uses. Being imbued with the spirit of Valkyrie Brunhilde gives Jane the strength and power set of an Asgardian warrior. In addition, there are specific powers that are also granted to Valkyries like herself. She can teleport, has death perception, and can see ghosts in addition to being a super strong and capable fighter. Number 6. Starbrand I kind of miss when Brandy was just like a little Starbrand baby. But of course, this is comics and heroes can't stay babies forever. In fact, they can't even stay a baby for more than a year apparently. Especially if they're joining the Avengers, which I kind of get. Technically, the young Starbrand baby Selby, later given the first name Brandy, was in the care of the Avengers. Not really specifically on the team, kind of sort of like their ward. But despite being one of the youngest heroes to ever be affiliated, with that team, this little star brand also would often help the team out on missions, being so insanely powerful. Star brand possesses the star brand, which grants her a great amount of basically cosmic power. She is capable of interstellar flight and flight in general, energy manipulation and projection, creating energy blasts, and technically should also be super durable and have some level of healing factor. The star brand's power is believed to be potentially infinite when it comes to their power levels, making star brand one of the most powerful members on the team, in baby form, child form, or young adult form as she currently is as of the end of issue 52 of the current 2018 Avengers series. Number 5. Ultimate Thor Thunderer Thorleaf, as he was known during his battle world days, was the one responsible for defeating Rune Thor and killing him in the end. This version of Thor initially forgot who he was and for a while in the Ultimate line he was just a nurse by the name of Thorleaf Golman, who believed he was human. In the end, however, Thor would begin to remember Asgard, experiencing what others believed were delusions. Even readers thought he might actually be going insane, and we weren't really sure if he was really Thor or if it was all in his head, but later on it was revealed that he was in fact the real deal, the Norse god of thunder, and the real Thor in the Ultimate Universe of Earth 1610. Thor was established as one of the most powerful characters in the entire ultimate universe, and even when he doesn't have his innate powers, which would later be restored to him by Odin, he has his EDI biomechanical suit to back him up, which grants him abilities and attributes similar to his godlike ones. Number 4. Goddess of Thunder Jane Foster has been known by many different heroic mantles. One, she is a doctor, which kind of makes her like an everyday hero, that's like an everyday hero mantle. And two, she is currently a Valkyrie and was one of the last Valkyries besides, well, until the return of the Valkyries, which kind of semi-randomly happened during the King in Black event. But in between, Jane Foster was known as Thor, taking up the mantle after Thor Odinson was deemed unworthy during the original Sin event. In many ways, Jane was considered to rival Thor in power, and at times even bested him. She also took up the mantle despite having cancer in her human form, and despite the fact that transforming into Thor basically cancelled out the effects of her chemo, meaning that her cancer was only getting worse and worse from her transformations. So even though it was killing her, she was like, I'm still going to be Thor. 
And man, you gotta you gotta respect Jane for that. That's pretty crazy. Number three, MCU Thor. The Thor of the Marvel Cinematic Universe became so powerful that he didn't even need to have a hammer to use his power. This is a Thor who realized the power was inside him all along in Ragnarok, and despite becoming Bro Thor in Avengers Endgame due to well his depression surrounding losing Asgard and then being unable to defeat Thanos, still was immensely powerful throughout that film. In fact, the Russo brothers confirmed in a post on Reddit that Bro Thor was no weaker than he was previous to this state. And he remained super powerful, but he was just going through some, some stuff at that time. In Avengers Infinity War, Thor was able to restart the forge at Nita Vialir with the help of Rocket, doing the unthinkable and holding the iris that focuses the neutron star within the forge open himself, which meant he himself was hit with the star's powerful energy. Thor held the iris open long enough to ensure the top of Stormbreaker at least was forged, which when you think about it and you talk about it, it's kind of weird. But when it happened in the movie, you were like, oh, that's nice. Number two, Beta Ray Bill. Beta Ray Bill deserves a lot of respect for just how powerful he is. So powerful, in fact, that even Odin was forced to recognize him after he bested Thor in combat. This happened back when Thor, being separated from his hammer, turned him back into Donald Blake. Remember those days? While he was separated from Mjolnir, Bill managed to get his hands on Blake's cane and summon Mjolnir's power for himself, being deemed worthy to wield it. This prompted Thor and Beta Ray Bill to battle over who should possess Mjolnir, and Beta Ray Bill was actually the victor of that fight. However, However, despite winning, and despite the fact that the fight was to the death, he decided to actually spare Thor's life. Odin decided to acknowledge his power, seeing how great of a warrior he was, and made him his own Asgardian weapon to wield moving forward, known as Stormbringer. Also, Scuttlebutt. <laughs> I just like saying the name of that chip. Scuttlebutt. It's a good name. Number one, King Thor. One of the most powerful alternate versions of Thor, hands down, has to be the alternate future version from Earth 14412, King Thor. This isn't just because of his power as ruler of Asgard and Allfather, a power which Thor would actually rename as the Thor Force once inherited, but this version of Thor has also bonded with and wielded the all black Necro Sword, and was also known for a time by another more powerful name and mantle, King Phoenix. This happened after Wolverine relinquished the Phoenix Force and thereby his life to supercharge Mjolnir and helping King Thor to defeat Doom, because that's basically what he needed. He needed the Phoenix Force to do that. Never fear though, after Doom was defeated, the Phoenix Force managed to later resurrect Logan, because uh, that's how the Phoenix Force do. So even though Logan was like, I give up my life and my power for you, Thor, he's still got to come back after. And at number 10, The Founders. The West Coast Avengers debuted in their own self-titled comic, but the initiative to create a team located on the other side of the country was spearheaded in The Avengers, from a member of the team who wasn't even a part of the initial lineup, Vision. The android came up with the idea after The Avengers found themselves preoccupied and overwhelmed by the events of Secret Wars with most of their heavy hitters tied up in other matters. Now, Vision stayed with the Avengers on the East Coast, and Hawkeye was named the chair of the WCA, and became a founding member, which led the team in over 102 issues. Up next, number nine, past members. So aside from Hawkeye, who else has been on the team? The founding members were Hawkeye, Mockingbird, War Machine, who everyone initially thought was Iron Man, funny enough, Wonder Man, and Tigra. Now from there, Hawkeye recruited many other additional characters over the years, including Scarlet Witch, Iron Man, the real one this time, the Thin Hank Pym, specifically as a scientific consultant, Moon Knight, Firebird, The Wasp, and of course, Vision, with that group of heroes popping up in the second volume of the series at varying points in time. Human Torch, Quicksilver, Machine Man, Living Lightning, Spider Woman, and Dark Hawk would all have stints with the team too, primarily after 1989. A whole other team of WCA members would pop up during the Fresh Start initiative at Marvel, but we'll get to them a bit later on. In at number 8, the name change. The West Coast Avengers haven't always been referred to as such. Now, back in 1984, when the team was introduced, there was a bit of a backlash amongst fans concerning a second Avengers team. It seemed kind of gimmicky. Oh, if those fans could see contemporary comics now. Now, after several years leading into the 1990s, the WCA weren't the only Avengers team.
scene kicking around. So to ensure that fans and readers would not get confused, Marvel decided that the best thing to do was to change all of their Avengers titles, so that they could be found alphabetically next to each other at comic book stores. In other words, the team names were altered so that the word Avengers was the first word in their title. Now the West Coast Avengers were changed to the Avengers West Coast, a title which was eventually cancelled in 1994. In at number 7, The Suicide Attempt. The West Coast Avengers history is filled with a whole lot of interpersonal drama, just like the Avengers is. Perhaps one of the most intense story arcs though to have appeared in the West Coast Avengers is when Hank Pym joined the team as a scientific consultant, after his mental health took a turn for the worse when he was a part of the Avengers. Now, Between issues 17 and 24 of the West Coast Avengers Volume 1, Hank is suicidal, and actually writes suicide letters, including ones to Tony and Tigra. Meanwhile, while Hank is having a personal crisis, the WCA are off fighting desert inspired supervillains that are wacky as hell. Overall, that story arc just had a lot of strange things going on. Not that suicide is strange, but everything else surrounding the West Coast Avengers at the time was pretty whack. Hank, back at the base, talks to his ex-wife Janet, aka the Wasp, who had divorced him after the infamous wife beating incident, and essentially says goodbye to her, giving her some really bad vibes about what's going on with him. Then Hank gets a gun, puts it to his head, but before he can shoot, he's interrupted by Firebird, who talks to him into appreciating his god-given gifts. He then gets a little manic and goes through a strange confidence boost, calling himself Dr. Pym as his superhero alias, and then freaks out momentarily when he thinks Firebird is a nun. She reassures him that she isn't, and then they make out. Overall, not the best way to approach mental health issues, as, as we're very much aware. He challenges Moon Knight to a fight, then chickens out, and then goes off to help save the WCA who are trapped in the past. It's a whole roller coaster of emotion for Hank. And at number 6, Ultimate Marvel. Of course the West Coast Avengers have an alternate version of themselves. This specific alternate can be found in the Ultimates Marvel Universe. They are a secret team created by S.H.I.E.L.D. called the West Coast Ultimates that consisted of Vision, Quake, Wonder Man, Black Knight, and Tigra. And they've been through some pretty wild stuff. For starters, they were sent out to find Osama Bin Laden, but failed when Wonder Man hulked out and then the team had to fight him to settle him down. Now, Seeing this, Nick Fury decided that it would be best to put them all in stasis tubes, holding them until they were needed. Flash forward to the United We Stand storyline, in which the Children of Tomorrow, aka Reed Richards' fanatical cult, kills the US President and both Houses of Congress, igniting a civil war. The state of California wanted to break apart and become its own country, but Steve Rogers, who had been elected president, denied them of it. So the state's governor decided to take the group out of S.H.I.E.L.D.'s custody and unleash them against the Ultimates, Earth 1610's version of the Avengers. Number 5. Miss America Raised in a dimension outside of time and space known as the Utopian Parallel, America Chavez is one of Marvel's newer teen heroes, and she is a powerhouse to say the least. She's been a member of multiple super teams, including the Young Avengers, A-Force, the West Coast Avengers, and the Ultimates, and belongs to the younger generation of heroes who will potentially be the stars of Marvel stories in the future. Chavez gained her powers as a young girl from a magical entity that resided where she lived, and these powers are superhuman strength and speed, star portal creation which allows her to travel the multiverse, and of course, hypercosmic awareness alongside a number of other powers and abilities. When her dimension was threatened by black holes, her mother sacrificed themselves to save it, and Chavez ran away from home to travel across dimensions. This began her journey both literally and emotionally from girl to superhero. Since her introduction, America has taken part in many huge plot points, one of the biggest being her role in Civil War II. Now, I won't spoil too much of it for you because it absolutely deserves a read, but let's just say she was smart enough to outsmart Captain Marvel and Spectrum. Appearing for the first time in 2011's Vengeance number one, wanna check her out for yourself. Number four, Captain Universe. Tamara DeVoe, aka Captain Universe, was once a woman who suffered from some pretty bad amnesia after a car crash. Although that's not the greatest outcome, she was also imbued with the power of the Enigma Force in the aftermath, so I guess that's somewhat of a bright side? Now what's the Enigma Force? Well, it is a mystical energy that passes through the Microverse in order to protect and preserve the Microverse. The wielders of this force are imbued with the Unipower, a facet of the Enigma Force, that gives the wielder some pretty, pretty sweet powers. In Tamara's case, she was given the ability to manipulate matter and energy, and can also use Univision, which allows her to sense things on a subatomic level or at great distances, or she can use it to literally force someone to tell the truth. Her first mission with the Avengers was actually on Mars to stop the powerful beings Ex Nihilo, Abyss, and Aleph from terraforming the Earth in their image. When Tamara approached them, both Nihilo and Abyss recognized her as their literal goddess and the physical manifestation of the universe itself, so they immediately submitted and just agreed to her terms. However, Aleph did not and just straight up attacked her. Captain Universe easily burned the robot to ashes with a single touch, and the Avengers returned to Earth after a very easy job well done. That wasn't her only mission with the team though, but I will let you check that one 
one out for yourself. Give her story a read starting with 2013's Avengers Volume 5, number one. Number three, Ares. Inspired by a Greek god of the same name, Ares was initially introduced as an antagonist to Thor. However, in 2006, Ares became more of an anti-hero, which inevitably led to him joining forces with the Avengers. Thanks to his Olympian physiology, Ares possesses superhuman strength, speed, stamina, durability, and agility, and is a true immortal, meaning that he can't die by any conventional means. Not only that, Ares has the ability to manipulate war, strife, combat, and all forms of conflict, including mental, physical, spiritual, and conceptual ones, regardless of the area and numbers involved, meaning he can control how they progress. Immediately following the superhero civil war over its legislation, Iron Man and Miss Marvel traveled to Ares' construction site to recruit him for their new Avengers team. Agreeing that the heroes had ruined his civilian cover, Ares eventually agreed to join the team after Iron Man threatened to deport him to Olympus if he didn't register with the US government and promised a salary similar to that of his construction job. He played a pivotal role in Ultron's defeat and was also largely responsible for bringing down Norman Osborn's Dark Avengers. That victory was sadly bittersweet though because it led to his death as he was just straight up ripped completely in half. Don't worry though, like I said, he is a god so he was resurrected not too long after. Check out his entire story for yourself starting with his first appearance all the way back in the Golden Age in 1942's comedy comics number 10. Number 2, Gilgamesh. Often referred to as the Forgotten One, Gilgamesh's heroic exploits have become so legendary over the millennia that he's often referred to as heroes of myth like Hercules and of course Gilgamesh, which kind of explains his name and why he goes by Gilgamesh. He is one of, if not the strongest member of the hidden group of superpowered beings known as the Eternals, an ancient race of genetically altered humans created by the Celestials. Alongside his teammates, he helps shield humanity from the vicious deviants, though Gilgamesh seems to have a very soft spot for protecting the people of Earth. He joined the Avengers in a time where their membership was at an all-time low, and although his time with them was pretty short, he was an absolutely vital member of the team. While all Eternals were born with an inherent set of superhuman abilities including super strength, Gilgamesh's strength far exceeds that of any of his counterparts, making him one of the most physically powerful characters in all of Marvel, with strength comparable to that of Hercules, Thor, and any other godlike being. As a result of countless millennia of training, Gilgamesh is also an extremely skilled hand-to-hand -hand combatant, which coupled with his imperviousness to damage makes him one of Marvel's most dangerous characters. As is the case with most Eternals, Gilgamesh can also emit deadly beams of light, heat, and physical force from his hands and eyes, and can manipulate matter to a limited degree. Give his story a read for yourself starting with 1977's Eternals, number 13. Number 1, Blue Marble. Adam Brashear, aka Blue Marble, was known as a child prodigy from an early age and has PhDs in electrical engineering and theoretical physics. After serving his time in the Korean War, Adam joined and led a project attempting to harness antimatter by creating a negative reactor. But unfortunately, there was an unexpected explosion, and both he and and his partner Connor Sims were exposed to the radiation. Now Sims wasn't too lucky and his whole body just disassembled, but Adam was able to become a stable antimatter reactor and develop some pretty sweet powers. As Blue Marvel, he possesses super strength that rivals both the Hulk and Thor, can manipulate antimatter into energy blast, can fly, is pretty much invulnerable, and is also pretty much immortal as he ages much slower than the normal human, making him a serious force to be reckoned with. As a part of the Mighty Avengers, both the 1970s and the one led by Luke Cage and the Ultimates, we have seen Blue Marvel go up against the likes of the Death Walkers, King Hyperion, and one time he even flew straight through Shumagorath's head because why not, right? Not only that, he has been seen able to withstand the blast of a hydrogen bomb and can even go toe to toe with Captain Marvel and come out relatively unscathed. So, yeah. He deserves the top spot today. Check him out for yourself, starting with 2009's Adam, Legend of the Blue Marvel, number one. Number 10, Agent 13. While Sharon Carter might just be your average run-of-the-mill human on paper, in reality, she is anything but your run-of-the-mill human when it comes to her capabilities. When the Secret Avengers team was brought together following the disbanding of Norman Osborn's Dark Avengers and Hammer, Captain America decided not to resurrect S.H.I.E.L.D., but instead create his own sub-Avengers teams to help keep the world safe. One of the these teams was the Secret Avengers, and Sharon Carter was entrusted to be his kind of co-captain for it. Sharon Carter is Agent 13. Sharon was inspired to become an agent by tales that her Aunt Peggy Carter told her of her own heroics as well as Captain America's. She joined S.H.I.E.L.D. and is considered to be among one of their best agents, being an expert in hand-to-hand -hand combat as well as firearms. More importantly, Sharon is also a great tactician, strategist, and leader. Number 9, Goliath. Despite the fact that he died on the team, Goliath was still a powerful member. Goliath is Bill Foster, who used to work with Dr. Hank Pym as his assistant. Being a brilliant scientist himself, Foster was able to duplicate the formula for Pym particles. Exposing himself to Pym particles, he was given the ability to alter his size, turning himself into a giant. Well, at will. He could turn himself into a giant and then shrink back down. Hence the name Goliath. 
Safely, Foster could grow to 25 feet in height. His increase in size also gave him a great increase in strength and somewhat in durability due to his change in mass. The formula also allows his body to change so that it can actually support the weight of his new and larger form while he is transformed. However, Goliath was vulnerable if he changed sizes multiple times in a shorter period as it left him weakened somewhat and exhausted temporarily. It's hard on the body, basically. He died during his time serving on the Secret Avengers during the first Civil War, which was actually the first Secret Avengers team, but not the first volume of Secret Avengers, to be clear. To some, his death only strengthened their conviction for the cause, and to others, it acted as a warning to basically leave the team and gave them a signal that like actually what they were doing maybe it wasn't maybe it wasn't a good idea. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want to learn more about other sub Avengers teams or more about the Secret Avengers, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. There's still lots of powerful members that I haven't talked about yet, so we could probably do a part two for this one. Number eight, Ant-Man. Ant-Man for the purpose of this list is actually Eric O'Grady, not Hank Pym or Scott Lang. During the Secret Avengers run that Ant-Man was a part of, the mantle was being held by Eric. If you thought Scott's past and thieving actions were questionable, Eric basically puts him to shame. Eric is probably the baddest of the Ant-Men in terms of his morals. Although I think all Ant-Men have made some more questionable choices in their life. Still, O'Grady really takes the cake overall. Eric O'Grady is more commonly known as the Irredeemable Ant-Man, which was the name of his Ant-Man series, which really gives you an idea of what type of character he is. However, Eric had decided to turn over a new leaf and really try to make a difference in the world and become a hero, which was what motivated him to accept a position on the Secret Avengers team. Although to be clear, up to this point, he was still a hero. He just was kind of like a very morally corrupt hero. <laughs> He possesses the Ant-Man suit, which gives him his powers, allowing him to change size, shrinking down, and later growing in size as well. He can also communicate with and command insects. He can also, I think, do some cool energy blasty stuff. So he's pretty powerful. But still, it's Eric O'Grady. It's, it's not like Hank Ant-Man. I think those are two different levels. Number seven, Beast. Beast is Hank McCoy, one of the original members of the X-Men and also one of the brainiest members of the Secret Avengers. He ends up being recruited for his brilliant mind, but there is a lot that Beast brings to the table when it comes to his skill and his power set. In the comics, it's also been established that he is incredibly, impossibly agile and dexterous. He also possesses superhuman strength, endurance, and durability. He has healing factor, which allows him to recover more quickly than most from injury and also slows his aging. His senses are heightened and he has strong telepathic defenses which can protect him against even some of the strongest psionics in the world of Marvel. He also has a few unique powers such as his ability to be aware of the time stream which makes him more aware if something is altered or otherwise out of place within it. He's also believed to have some level of pheromone powers. In other words, you really shouldn't underestimate Beast. I don't say it enough but he truly is a beast of a superhero who brings a lot to the table. I'm happy I was able to put him on this list. Do you agree that Hank should be above Ant-Man? I don't know, but I think he deserves it, you know? Not enough appreciation for Hank McCoy. Number six, Moon Knight. Moon Knight was considered a questionable recruit to the post-Dark Reign Secret Avengers team the Cap brought together. And yet he still makes a lot of sense when you consider just how dangerous and how capable he is. Moon Knight might live with a disassociative identity disorder, but this often doesn't get in his way of completing whatever mission he is on and his own heroic life. Nor does it often affect his ability to be a hero. Still, the other heroes on the team did personally question if Moon Knight was the right fit and the right pick. Moon Knight has access to amazing weapons and tech thanks to being outfitted by Stephen Grant, another prominent persona that resides in Mark Spector's psyche, who is a millionaire. He also has tons of intel, which is provided to him through one of his other personas, Jake Lockley, who's a cab driver. When it comes to his power set, he is an incredibly skilled fighter who has the favor of a god, the moon god, Khonshu, on his side, and this also makes him hard to kill because usually Khonshu will just bring him back to life. He's also got enhanced strength, endurance, and agility at night, especially if it's a full moon. Moon power, baby. Get that moon power. 
Number 5. Ghost Rider While Starbrand might have the greatest potential for power, and we aren't sure entirely what she's capable of just yet, Robbie Reyes is a bit more experienced when it comes to his powers. And even when he was less experienced, he actually accidentally killed one of the previous Starbrands, Kevin Connor, in Marvel Legacy. So for those reasons, I thought we should give him a bit of a boost when it comes to his ranking on this list. Robbie Reyes first appeared in the comic scene in 2014 in all new Ghost Rider issue number one. He is an all new Ghost Rider, just like the series claims. During a street race gone wrong, Robbie was killed and ended up possessed by the ghost who haunted the car that he was driving, becoming the new Ghost Rider. He joined up with the Avengers recently in the comics, and I think he makes a great addition to the team. I personally love Robbie Reyes, so... Yeah, I'm here for it. Number 4. Winter Hulk While Jennifer Walters as She-Hulk may have joined the Avengers long ago, first joining up back in the 80s, she has gone through a lot of changes since then. One recent and major one which also returned her to her smaller, smarter, more playful and sassy yet still very powerful form happened recently in Avengers comics. For a brief time, She-Hulk, then known as Just Hulk, ended up becoming Winter Hulk. Winter Hulk happened as a result of Jen allowing herself to be kidnapped by the Winter Guard of Russia to try and figure out what they were up to. What devious things are they planning? In the end, they attempted to mind wipe and brainwash Hulk to turn her into one of their agents. And uh, they kind of succeeded. Although the process was interrupted, for a brief time Jen acted as their agent, Winter Hulk. However, as Winter Hulk, Jen still managed to fight against her programming, and alert her fellow Avengers when sent to attack Namor and Atlantis. In the end, Winter Hulk was forced to absorb a ton of radiation to protect the citizens of Atlantis. She managed to discharge the gamma radiation she had absorbed safely, and as a result was returned to her original form, ultimately deciding to retire from the Avengers team after these events, and return to practicing law. And now we have a new She-Hulk series that I have heard nothing but good things about. I really need to get reading my first issue. <laughs> Number 3. Phoenix While Phoenix is definitely one of the most powerful superheroes to be on the Avengers team, her history with them is uh, a bit more lengthy than you might initially think which is why I ranked her a little bit lower on this list than I normally would. Phoenix herself was back on the original Avengers team, the prehistoric Avengers, or the Avengers of 1 million BC. This avatar for Phoenix was known as Firehair. However, Firehair only made her first appearance even in 2017 in the comics. So she's also kind of new in a way, even though she's super old. Does that make sense? Maya Lopez, aka Echo, is the current host of the Phoenix Force and the current Phoenix, who also finds herself on the Avengers team. Her being Phoenix is new, but her being on the Avengers team is not new. She rejoined the team in 2021 as Phoenix, which is quite new, like I said, but she actually was a member of the Avengers way back in 2005, when she was using the mantle of Ronin. Still, Maya being Phoenix and being part of the Avengers altogether is quite fresh right now, despite both the Phoenix Force's history with the prehistoric team and Maya's own history with the present day team. And of course, Phoenix is one of the most powerful entities in the entire Marvel Universe. So despite her being kind of a new, old combo thing, we have to show respect to the blazingly brilliant and powerful Maya Lopez, aka Echo, aka Phoenix, on this list. Number 2. Cable Nathan Summers ended up joining the Avengers team at a time when Captain America was seeking to present a show of unity. Hence, Cable ended up being on the Avengers Unity Division, which was meant to bring together Avengers and X-Men after events of Avengers vs X-Men had created tension between the two superhero groups of Earth. Series wise, the team was known as the Uncanny Avengers, with Cable joining up as early as issue number 4. Cable is an extremely powerful telepath and telekinetic due to him being the offspring of X-Men member Cyclops and his wife at the time, Mr. Sinister created clone of Jean Grey, Madeline Pryor. Despite Maddie being his birth mother, Jean has also been like a mother to Nate after she was implanted with the memories of basically raising him, making her kind of like his telepathically retcon mom, with Maddie becoming more like a surrogate mother in terms of her relationship with Nate, formerly known to her as Baby Christopher. 
Oh baby Christopher. Number 1. Avenger Prime Avenger Prime is kind of like all of the Avengers merged together. At least, that's what the original version of this character was like. They made their first appearance in the 2013 Mighty Avengers series, but another character with that name also recently reappeared in the 2021 free comic book day Avengers and Hulk comic. They showed up in the Avengers portion of that double feature story comic. Here, Avengers Prime is the leader of the Deathlock Avengers forces, who basically stands guard at the God Quarry, seeking to watch, protect, and warn against major multiversal threats and potential chronal collapses. Presumably, this is some version of Avenger Prime that decided to stay omnipotent and bonded together. At least that's what I'm assuming. Some people are assuming different things. When we saw Avenger Prime last, or an alternate version of them, if you will, they were created using a ritual which allowed the team of Mighty Avengers to bond together. Technically, Avenger Prime stands to be the most powerful of the Avengers, as they should be made up of one or more teams or rosters potentially combined together. Now, of course, some people believe that Avenger Prime is actually some sort of alternate version or uh, some future version of Tony Stark, aka Iron Man, but we don't really know for sure yet. Whoever they are, though, they definitely seem to have a lot of time, a lot of power, and a lot of resources on their hands, especially for being a shadowy figure. Kicking off the list at number 10. Ghost Spider. Coming from Earth 11638, aka the perfect world, okay, this Peter Parker has a much brighter beginning, meaning Uncle Ben never actually passed away and gave the whole great responsibility speech. Instead, he encourages Peter to become a stronger Spider Man, which sounds good on paper. It sounds like the ideal world. But does he recommend protein shakes and proper exercise and nutrition? No. See, Uncle Ben pushes Peter to abduct Spider Man from other worlds and then absorb their life force via this portal that. Parker Technologies created. So he's a bit of a dick, this Uncle Ben. He's not really the nicest guy. Maybe he's fine. I don't know. This whole system seems a little bit whack. Now, eventually, Earth 616 Spider Man shows up. They both hear about each other. It's interesting because Uncle Ben poisons our Peter, and then he wakes up confused, and they fight it out. And our Peter Parker comes out on top, luckily, with the perfect, amazing spider getting his soul sucked into that machine. Now, the perfect Spider Man spirit was then trapped in the underworld like hell, and then from here, it only gets more strange. Well, well, rather it gets more Banner. See, Banner was the current Sorcerer Supreme at this time, so he ended up freeing Peter in his astral form, but then Peter absorbed all those spirits of the damned while he was down there, so when he came back up, this perfect spider was now Ghost Spider. Number nine, Old Man Spider. Ezekiel Sims from Earth 4, AKA Old Man Spider, took over the web slinging spot after Peter Parker lost his life to Moreland. Now, Ezekiel first appeared in Edge of Spider Verse issue five. He was actually recruited by Spider UK, who I'll talk about a little bit later, to go against Moreland and the Inheritors. Now, Ezekiel rescued Ben Riley and Kane from the Inheritors, which is awesome. And then a bunch of other spider beings were then recruited, but Deimos tracked them down and snapped this Spider-Man's neck. He caught him off guard. Brutal. And in his last words, he revealed his true self and told Peter to protect Silk, aka the Bride. All that matters. What a beautiful last sentence. We love impactful last words here at Top 10 Nerd. It's the best. And you know what else we like? We like when you like our videos. Literally, go and give this video a thumbs up and it will do wonders for our channel. We're trying our best, so, you know, all we ask is for a little click. Maybe subscribe, maybe like, maybe notifications if you're feeling good. I don't know. Let's get back to the list. Number eight, Spider UK. Here he is. Billy Braddock himself. I told you I'd talk about him. He began his life as Captain Britain, actually, before he was webbing people up. So he's actually rocking both teams. He's a busy guy. He's on the Captain Britain team and then the Spider Army. He made his first appearance in Edge of Spider-Verse issue 2 over on Earth 833. Now, this Spider-Man is one of my favorite versions. His arc is so fun. He can hop between dimensions whenever he chooses, and then after the defeat of the Inheritors, spoilers, he keeps an eye on Earth 3145, and then during the Spider-Geddon storyline in issue 2, Spider- UK dies in an explosion and it's buried in England on Earth 803, the home of Lady Spider, who loved the idea of Spider UK being buried in the same cemetery as her parents because she loved him, loved him like a brother, of course. Brother zoned, even after death. He's down there like, really? Okay. Number seven, Spider-Man. Literally, this gets a little gross. Now imagine if Spider-Man had more spider than man when he was bit. That's what happened to Patton Parnell when he first entered comics in Edge of Spider-Verse issue four. See, Patton lived a pretty dark life. He lived with an abusive Uncle Ted. He would perform horrible experiments on animals and he spied on his neighbor, Sarah Jane. So it's not a healthy system that he's got going on here in any way, really. One day, Sarah Jane and Patton went to Alcorp Industries in hopes of freeing all these test animals, but that's when Patton saw this red 
radioactive spider. He was like, mm, I wanna touch it. And then he did, got bit, and then got kicked out. Now, overnight, he didn't get jacked. His vision didn't get better. He wasn't webbing up Dr. Peppers and lamps. When he got his abilities, he started eating everything. He ate a mouse, and then he ate a cat, and then when Uncle Ted walked in, he was like, what's up? Now, this version is, of course, extremely powerful, but he's also extremely dark. We love the balance. We love balance. Number six, Spider Cyborg. Coming from Earth 2818, this version is a dark future Spider-Man. I mean, look at him. Of course, there's some sort of future-ness going on here. He made his first debut in Superior Spider-Man issue 33. Now, it's Peter Parker if he got cybernetic additions. It's badass. That's basically all it is. His one eye can zoom in, go all tactical. The claws can certainly leave a mark. And one of the most remarkable features, um, his arm cannon, his sonic arm cannon, that's definitely a plus. Now, before Karn came to Earth 2818, our Superior Spider-Man warned him, and then when Kane finally did show up, Superior Spider-Man and some other webbed friends joined the battle. His left eye being a red lens is actually a nod to his appearance early on in the 90s in Spider-Man issue 21, titled Dealing Arms. Number five, Devil Dinosaur. Okay, look, he ain't on the team at all, really, but he did kind of help them unintentionally, and I also really want to talk about this dino since I haven't before, so... Devil Dinosaur! He's basically just a big, red, intelligent T-Rex from another universe. Not intelligent enough to talk or anything, but he understands the situations he's in, can understand human language, and even has some telepathic connection with certain characters. As for the Savage Avengers, in Volume 2, Issue 2, the Savage heroes have been sent back in time to the Hyborian Era, and they end up fighting Devil Dinosaur in a coliseum. That is, until they sort of kind of not really work together to bust out of there. He doesn't have many powers other than super intelligence and strength, but he is a Tyrannosaurus Rex, which I can imagine is very helpful. Number four. Wolverine. This mutant needs almost no introduction, being one of the most recognizable characters in Marvel's lineup. James Logan Howlett is a long-lived Canadian mutant with the rage of a beast and the soul of a samurai. His mysterious past is filled with blood, war, and betrayal, creating one of the greatest characters Marvel has ever made. If you don't already know his powers, Wolverine has an accelerated healing factor, keenly enhanced senses, and bone claws in each hand, which were improved upon when his whole skeleton, including the claws, were coated in adamantium, one of the hardest metals on Earth. This rage-filled samurai mutant Canadian joined up with the Savage Avengers in 2020 to help fight against Cool and Gat, and he's honestly a great addition to every team he joins. So let's hear some love for Wolverine! Yeah! Woo! Okay! Moving on. Number three, the Venom symbiote. I say specifically the symbiote because at this time, Eddie Brock and Venom were having a bit of a rough period and had separated from each other for the time being. At least, that's what I've gathered from reading. Either way, alerted to the suffering of another member of his species at the hands of Cool and Gath, the Venom symbiote arrived where the future Savage Avengers were at to help Logan, the Punisher, Elektra, and Dr. Voodoo fight the eldritch god Cool and Gath was trying to summon. Exposure to the god's cosmic radiation caused the Venom symbiote to take on the form of a massive dragon, letting it hold its own against the god in combat. The symbiote would do its best to help in the fight, saving the other members of its species in the process. But he's Venom! We all know how cool he is. I don't really have to explain this to you. I hope. Number two, Dagger. When her boyfriend Rob left for college, Tandy Bowen, a 16 year old girl who grew up in Shaker Heights, Ohio, left home on a bus for New York City. While wandering the streets, a man tried to mug her, but she was rescued by Tyrone Johnson, a fellow runaway teen. She bought Tyrone food and the two grew to care about each other. But when a guy named Simon Marshall rounded up a bunch of the city's teen runaways, offering them food and shelter, Tandy agreed to go, being kind of naive. And Tyrone went with her because he wanted to protect Tandy, which was good because Tyrone was right to be suspicious. The runaway teens were knocked unconscious by Marshall's men and injected with an experimental substance. The two were the only teens who survived and soon developed powers. For Tandy, she can generate a form of living light, which is actually life force that she uses most commonly in the form of psionic light daggers, which travel wherever she wills them and which drain living beings of life force. Her light daggers also have the capacity to cure certain persons of substance addiction which is an interesting side effect. Tandy can also project her light into Cloak's dimension to feed his quote unquote hunger. She's unharmed when traveling through his dimension and can pass this protection to others, which leads me 
at the next spot. Number one, Cloak. Tyrone Johnson is the dark half of the vigilante duo known as Cloak and Dagger. After a substance related experiment awakened his powers, he became a living personification of darkness. Tyrone grew up in South Boston and had a really bad stuttering condition, which inadvertently caused him to be unable to save his friend's life. Tyrone ran away from the home because of the guilt of that, and he ended up in New York City's ports, desperate for food and searching for someone to rob. Instead, he found Tandy Bowen, another runaway, and ironically prevented her from being robbed. They eventually were subjected to the experimental substance that caused them to gain their powers. For Cloak, he has the ability to manipulate dark force energy and access the dimension that it comes from, which he uses to do things like creating localized fields of impenetrable darkness, creating mobile solid tendrils of darkness, hiding in shadows, becoming intangible, pulling people into the dark force dimension, trapping them there, and teleporting himself and others by taking an interdimensional shortcut through the dark force dimension. Clearly, very useful. Kicking off the list at number 10, Longbow. Coming from Earth 398, Longbow was a version of Clint whose reality was altered by Morgan Le Fay in Avengers Volume 3. The Queen's Vengeance storyline is so fun. I mean, just medieval stuff in general is so exciting. Especially archers back in those times. It's fascinating. They would just point to the sky and hope and be like, did we win? I don't know what happened. So when Hawkeye is altered, he becomes Longbow. But the fun part here is that Hawkeye's original 616 outfit was already quite mythical. He had the cowl, the long tunic, the purple vibes, so not much changed here for him. Hawkeye is actually pleased with his outfit upgrade, so are we. Him and Cap ride into the castle on horseback, which is amazing as is, and then we meet the rest of our heroes. They were able to set reality back to normal by having the Scarlet Witch combine her powers with the other Avengers and then push all that power right into Wonder Man. Hawkeye, sorry, Longbow, was one of the first to break free from Morgan Le Fay's spell. Although I kind of wish he stuck around for a bit longer, I don't know. He can stay like that forever, I love it. Number nine, Old Man Hawkeye. Coming from Earth 807-128, the Old Man Logan future where supervillains have taken over the world, and Hawkeye led other Avengers to Las Vegas as well as the Thunderbolts. But when they got there, the Thunderbolts betrayed the entire team and everybody bit the dust. It was horrible. Baron Zemo took out Black Widow but purposely spared Hawkeye just to torment him. The guy's a freak. Cut to decades later, he has the long white hair, he's really old now, he's ducking out in the woods. But he was soon hired by Jebediah Hammer to guard a delivery trip across South Dakota. During the trip, they were ambushed by the Madrox gang, and Hawkeye got most of them, but he missed the last shot. His glaucoma was now advancing, and give it a few months' time, he would be fully blind. So his last mission with Eyesight was to see his family, and then go after said Thunderbolts with Kate Bishop by his side. And of course, Old Man Hawkeye is a vital asset in the Old Man Logan storyline, where Clint recruits Logan to help him deliver a package to New Babylon. Also, fully blind. And before we continue on with this list, if you're loving this content, show us and hit that thumbs up. That way we know to give you some more Hawkeye, nerdy goodness, whatever the case is. You know what to do. Thank you so much. Back to the list. Number eight, Bullseye. One of my favorite versions of Hawkeye, well, it's actually not Hawkeye at all. It's a villain. It's Bullseye. Two eyes. One's bull, one's hawk. You get it. But the world doesn't know that. That's the scary part. Coming from the Dark Reign storyline where Norman Osborn takes control of the Avengers. It's a ride. All these supervillains dressed up as Earth's mightiest. It's all a big lie, but you know what? They do look pretty good. That's, I will admit. When the Dark Avengers were fighting a rogue Hulkbuster robot, Hawkeye handled the pilot in, well, a non-heroic way. After that point, the robot fell and subsequently took out 46 more civilians. That's a lot of death in a matter of 30 seconds. Later on, he saw a woman being robbed by three dudes and he just took out everybody instead of saving her. It's horrible. Luckily, a news crew saw this and they filmed the attack, but Hawkeye shot an arrow into the helicopter and blew it up to smithereens. This is all bad, just all bad. Powerful, but pretty bad nonetheless. Number seven, Ronan. If you saw the recent Hawkeye trailer, it's clear that Clint will have to face the music. He sported a new look in Endgame, took off some heads, he was real bad, but now everybody got snapped back and he's unretiring again, again. Again. This Ronin character comes from the New Avengers issue 27. See, Hawkeye was originally killed off, but later resurrected at the end of House of M. So when he rejoins the team, he had this new look to him. It was quite a big character change in the MCU, but as far as the comics went, there weren't a lot of fans of the Ronin look. Maybe that's why everybody's after him in the new show. They don't like his Ronin outfit. They're like, cut your hair. Please, also the tattoos. Nothing says Christmas than Hawkeye rocking sleeves and whipping arrows to people's necks. Let's do it, deck the halls. Number six, Clint Barton Jr. AKA Mustang. This version came from What If Volume Two, Issue 114. Clint Barton Jr. was the son of Hawkeye and 
Also Jennifer Walters, AKA She-Hulk. Secret Wars 25 years later. What if our heroes never left Battleworld? Well, it doesn't sound like they would be too bored because all the heroes and villains called a truce and then they settled down, all started hooking up with each other and started families in the city of Denver that was making up part of the planet. As Odin would say, Denver is not a place, it's a people. Denver, not Asgard, Denver. Not everybody was so chill though. I mean, the son of Doctor Doom and Enchantress, of course, was a little bit evil. So he gathered all the children of villains and there was a little fight, a little scrap happened. But when the Hulk created a device to return to Earth, all the kids returned only to find that Sentinels have now taken over and wiped out most of the planet's mutants. The kids take down one of them and then they decide that they're going to take down all the other ones on Earth, finally finding their true purpose 25 years later. Number five, magic. Ileana Rasputina is a mutant sorceress who rules the demonic realm known as Limbo. She was taken to Limbo by Belasco and in the few seconds that passed on Earth, Ileana aged years in Limbo. Time she spent mastering different dark arts. Magic also exhibited the mutant ability to mentally control stepping discs that are connected to Limbo and allow her and others to teleport across interstellar distances, space, and time. She joined the New Mutants and she has gone on to eventually join the ranks of the X-Men and has been mentored by Doctor Strange advancing her magical abilities even further, which is quite a statement as she is the Sorceress Supreme in her Limbo dimension, having been taught Black Magic by Belasco and White Magic from an alternate Aurora Monroe. And she was among those who were considered for becoming the new Sorcerer Supreme of Earth 616. Number 4, Dr. Voodoo. Jericho Drum is the master practitioner of Voodoo White Magic, according to the Book of Vishanti, and he has been stated as one of the most powerful mystic practitioners on the planet. Which is why it makes sense that he was the one to actually become the new Sorcerer Supreme for a while in Doctor Strange's place after the Eye of Agamotto deemed that he possesses a pure heart and a clean soul. Now his main magical ability allows him to interact with spirits for a number of different effects. He can summon skeletons, the spirits of the dead, and manipulate zombies with his necromancy. He can manipulate biological forces like animals and trees, as well as heal others, and he has even removed Frank Castle's mouth one time, which was pretty freaky. He has a degree of pyrokinesis, can control a voodoo, smoke, slash mist, and can manipulate and control people's souls. Now that is all on top of the normal mystical abilities he possesses through spells that were increased in potential when he was trained by Doctor Strange and when he became Sorcerer Supreme. Number 3, Doctor Doom. Victor Von Doom has been a staple villain in the worlds of Marvel Comics since 1962. But there is more to this incredibly powerful, super intelligent, and charismatic Latvian monarch. He has helped the forces of good on several occasions, even if it was for selfish ends, and has recently reformed and even become a hero. He held the power cosmic and the power of the Beyonder twice, becoming God King of Battleworld the second time. He is an incredibly capable character. Dr. Victor Von Doom was introduced to magic by his mother, but he expanded his knowledge by going through time and training with characters like Morgana Le Fay. He has proved capable of mystical blasts, force fields, ensnaring, banishing, and portals, summoning entities and demonic creatures, casting and reversing spells, teleportation, dimensional travel, healing of himself and others, time travel, power absorption, elemental manipulation, telekinesis, as well as power nullification. He also hones psionic abilities such as mind transference, hypnotism, and technopathy. He has been considered for the role of Sorcerer Supreme and it's just one of the best villains Marvel has ever created. Number 2, Doctor Strange. Dr. Stephen Strange. His magical feats are almost unmatched by any other. He is among the most adept magic user in the multiverse and has shown it many, many times. When he first came on the scene, and for a long while, he was so insanely powerful that he was capable of doing pretty much anything he wanted. It got to the point that Marvel even decided to depower him. He has passed a test in which he accepted death, which meant he now no longer ages and can only be de-lifed by external means meaning he is essentially a mortal. His energy blasts are capable of destroying moons and planets. You remember when I listed all the things Doctor Doom can do? Well, Strange can do all of them, probably better, and more. 
He has mastered the words of the black priests allowing him to distort reality. He frequently calls on the divine empowerment and extra dimensional energy of mystical and non mystical beings in multiple dimensions to power his spells. And he can use black magic like taking the power of another entity by force of will. But he has stopped using that kind of magic, so it's whatever. He is the defender of reality and has put together so many different crazy teams, including this one. Number one. Kang the Conqueror. Nathaniel Richards was born on the 30th century Earth of Reality 6311, where humanity never went into the Dark Ages. In this reality, after centuries of technological advancement and war, peace was finally brought to the Earth by a time traveler from Earth 616 also named Nathaniel Richards, known as the legendary benefactor. Now the Nathaniel Richards born to the 6311 reality is said to be a descendant of the benefactor through Reed Richards, although he may be descended from Dr. Doom. So already we're off to a confusing start and that's before we even get into the seemingly endless versions of him by different names and from different realities that are littered throughout Marvel comics and appear in the 616 reality. Basically, after landing in the 40th century, Nathaniel reinvented himself as Kang the Conqueror, conquering the Earth, then the galaxy, and then setting his sight on other times and realities. Apart from his advanced physiology and exceptional mind, Kang's battle armor is produced from a rare synthetic alloy from the 40th century and responds to his subconscious thoughts. It grants him abilities including enhanced strength, durability withstanding even a nuclear strike at point blank range, anti-gravity, video communication, time travel, concussive vaults, summoning any number of weapons which are transported to him through the time stream instantly, electric shocks, hover pads, survival kits, and body transference. He is an Avengers level threat and easily takes any of the top spots on this list. And a 10 yellow jacket. For several years, Pym had been in love with Janet Van Dyne, but because of his repressed personality and her abundant wealth, he resisted marrying her. One day while working in his laboratory though, whilst thinking of the fact that he wanted to marry Van Dyne but couldn't, Pym accidentally dropped and smashed some vials containing various unknown gases. These released gases wreaked a radical, temporary personality change for Pym, which could be seen as like a severe case of schizophrenia. He took on the new identity of the Yellow Jacket, claimed that he had murdered Henry Pym, kidnapped Van Dyne, and proposed to her, as Pym had long wanted to do. Realizing that Yellow Jacket was really Pym, Van Dyne decided to play along, fearing that she would worsen his psychological condition if she did otherwise. Yeah, the Avengers, not suspecting at first, were actually shocked to hear that she said yes to the proposal, but Van Dyne and Pym as Yellow Jacket were married at Avengers Mansion amidst an assembled group of Avengers who were active at the time, as well as some villains who were hiding and secretly pretending to be caterers. And in a 9 Ultimate Ant-Man, Hank Pym was a brilliant but mentally fragile scientist who was married to Janet Pym, but in this reality he was chosen to work on the Super Soldier Project for S.H.I.E.L.D. under Nick Fury. Hank was also the superhero Giant Man able to grow to 59 feet and 11 inches, with 60 feet being the point where the human skeleton cannot support the actual mass of the body. He gained his powers after experimenting on the blood of his wife Jan, who was actually a mutant. This guy though is a demon, able to go toe to toe with Cap and being willing to experiment on his wife without her consent. And this is even how, like I said, he got his original powers in this universe. This guy is also an absolute freak with a lack of morals. And his ability as a, as a part of like the super soldier program are certainly interesting. That's why he gets a spot on this list, okay? However, he's not as bad as some other versions of Ant-Man on this list, so uh, fasten your seatbelts. In an 8 pincer, Scott Lang of Earth-9907 is certainly an interesting one. Earth-9907 is an other dimensional Earth where the Red Skull won World War II and Victor Von Doom now leads the planet with a totalitarian military rule. On this planet, Scott Lang was a stuttering, sadistic madman who killed his own daughter at the request of Von Doom after Cassandra refused to swear allegiance. He also served with the Thunder Guard and worked with Henry Pym, where he learned of the Pym Particles. When the new generation of Avengers crossed over into this alternate world, Pincer was all too happy to have the chance to kill his daughter all over again. Yeah, cause she was an Avenger known as Stinger. His first chance was cut short through the interference of American Dream, but when he got his second chance, Stinger was able to defeat him. Plus, this guy just looks freaky as hell, his skin's all pink. He looks crazy. And it's 7 Black Ant. 
Black Ant was a life model decoy of the third Ant-Man who was killed in a battle against the Descendants. He was sent to join the Avengers on behalf of the Descendants as a double agent. Despite his programming though, the Black Ant still fought as Ant-Man with no obvious differences. During a fight against the Masters of Evil, because he was a robot, he was not affected by the control of the Serpent Crown. And as one of the only two Avengers free of the Taskmaster's influence, he and Venom battled the criminals and freed their teammates. So already, apparently being a robot man, a la seemingly any character in FNAF, already makes you have a leg up on the competition. Black Ant's heroic rescue of the team was short lived though, as Black Widow was quick to deduce that Black Ant was in fact now a robot working for the Descendants, somehow. I'm not quite sure how she actually picked up on that one, but like maybe she saw like a wire and some gears poking out of his ass or something. I don't get how she figured it out. But since Ant-Man had just saved the team, Hawkeye and the rest of the Avengers actually just refused to believe her accusations, so she quit the team in protest. Temper tantrums, we love them. And in six, Dwight Barrett. Dwight Barrett was a prodigy child who passed most of his time at Josie's bar, where his uncle Turk Barrett watched over him while he played around with the Ant-Man helmet that he was given as a gift. After the Venom symbiote clad Madroxes killed his uncle for helping Hawkeye against them though, Dwight used his Ant-Man helmet to rescue Hawkeye and escape with him to the Bishop Refuge, a hidden region of the wastelands where Hawkeye thought that they would be safe. Unbeknownst to them however, a piece of the Venom symbiote had actually stuck itself to the car they used to escape, allowing the creature to track them down. The Venoms were ultimately defeated by Hawkeye and Kate Bishop while Dwight stayed at the Bishop Refuge with the orphans who lived there. However, five years after these events, we see the events of Old Man Logan series. Dwight had claimed a bridge and started to charge a toll to use it. If whomever wanted to cross the bridge didn't actually pay what he asked, he would use the Ant-Man helmet to command a million ants into killing them. So... You either pay or you pay with your life. Hawkeye and Logan were some of those who actually paid in order to cross the bridge, but yeah, being able to reverse engineer an Ant-Man helmet at eight years old, yeah, you get on this list, bro. Number five, War Machine. War Machine is James Rhodes, who gets his powers from his Iron Man made armor. Donning this armor, he goes by the mantle of War Machine typically, but has also been known to wear the Iron Patriot armor and also use that moniker as well. In fact, during his time on the Secret Avengers team, Rhodey's War Machine armor received an upgrade that allowed him to phase and appear invisible, but he would actually give up the War Machine mantle to later become Iron Man in secret, and then end up later leaving the Secret Avengers team when he decided to take up the Iron Patriot armor and that name. Rhodey might get his powers from his suit, but the skills and knowledge which he uses to pilot them is all his own. So even without his armor, he's pretty powerful. I mean, he's a guy, but he's still a powerful guy. Also, he has lots of suits, so he also powerful in his suits. His suits of armor. Number four, Black Widow. Black Widow makes for a great addition to Captain America's Secret Avengers team that is formed following the end of Norman Osborn's Dark Reign. This team was one that Captain America brought together to basically serve as his Black Ops team. Their main mission was to help clean up all the messes that Norman Osborn had left about during his time ruling Hammer and the Dark Avengers. Considering that Natasha is a highly skilled and trained assassin who also has extensively reflected on the moral dilemma that comes attached to things like assassinating people and black ops, she makes a great fit. She is extremely experienced with walking that fine line between getting less savory jobs done, but also making sure you don't lose yourself and that you only do as much as is really necessary. Not only is she highly trained and skilled, but it's also implied that she technically has superpowers after being exposed to a Russian variation of the super soldier serum during her time in the Red Room. It's how she can stay so youthful and she looks so young forever. That Russian super soldier serum. <laughs> Making sense of how is Black Widow even still alive and what is going on. Number three, Valkyrie. Brunhilde is Valkyrie, or at least she was Valkyrie. Now there's another Valkyrie, and actually there's kind of like other Valkyries multiple Valkyries, but I digress. Brunhilde is also Valkyrie in the comics. She ended up joining the Secret Avengers after her apparent death during the Fear Itself event. As a character, she dies quite a bit to be honest, but she usually gets to return, which is awesome. As an Asgardian, Brunhilde has powers that come from just being of Asgard. She has superhuman strength, speed, durability, reflexes, has slowed aging, and an increased lifespan, and of course she can self heal. Although as I said, that doesn't always save her from dying which happens. Number two, Captain America. Probably one of the most important members 
of the Secret Avengers team at almost all times is Captain America. Captain America was the founder of the team the first time around and formed it to help fight back against Iron Man and the Superhuman Registration Act during Civil War. It was called Secret Avengers because of the fact that the team had to be kept secret, otherwise they would have been taken away and imprisoned due to the SRA or the SHRA. I don't know if superhuman, if those are their own letters or not. Captain America is a super soldier, a strong and motivational leader who also has super strength, speed, agility, speed, I said speed twice, but he's really speedy, I guess, and endurance, all thanks to him being exposed to the super soldier serum years ago in World War II. So he's not just super valuable as a leader, but he's also super powerful in general. Also, he's Captain freaking America. That's just having that name. I feel like if you're Captain America already, you get some kind of power level just from people being like, oh, it's Captain America. Number one, Nova. Nova is Richard Ryder. He basically came on to act as a Secret Avengers powerhouse when Captain America originally banded this team together after Hammer was disbanded, which I think means he gets our top spot by default. Also, Nova is just insanely powerful due to him being the host of the Nova Force. He only ended up sticking around for the first arc of the first Secret Avengers series volume as he had to go do some cosmic stuff and he was pulled away, but he was still a member for a time, so we can still count him. Nova is insanely strong, fast, durable, can self-heal, can fly. All also having the ability to fly through space, and he's super smart as he has access to the Xandarian world mind, basically giving him access to all the knowledge of Xandar. So yeah, he's got it all, baby. He's got the strength, he's got the wits, he's got that sweet look in his awesome suit with his awesome helmet. He's got it all, except he doesn't have the time to be on the Secret Avengers for too long. That's what he doesn't have. He lacks time.